great pleasure of handing uh, the baton to the president of City College, uh, who is going to uh, be our next uh, speaker in um, this uh, Rifkin Center uh, Symposium on New Normal, uh, Presidential Politics and the University, 2017. So uh, Vince Boudreau is our president of City College. Thank you. Um, calling me the next speaker maybe elevates what I plan to do. I mainly intend to welcome you and to say how, how pleased I am and grateful that uh, for Charlie and Mandel for organizing this and for our speakers for being here today. But I do want to say something a little bit about um, the role of the university at this moment. I, I, as I see it, all universities share some obligations. Public universities have some particular obligations. And again, I think particularly in this moment, we have these obligations. We, all of us, take students in every year, and, and, and we have an obligation to our students. We have an obligation to the people who send the students here, families and friends, to, to, to educate them, and to, to, to take care of them in some ways. And, and again, in this moment, the obligations that we have to take care of the whole people, all of our students, are particularly sharp. You may or may not know of the 100, 109 students at CUNY who are affected by the travel ban. 66 of them are City College students. So this is absolutely a City College problem. But if you follow the news even a little bit, you know that students from these seven countries, it's really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, news came across today of um, Professor Khan, who father of the, of the, the slain soldier and a citizen for 30 years is having his travel papers reviewed. And, and, and so to think that those on this campus who are in danger are confined to the 66 students from these seven countries is uh, naive and, and incorrect. We, so we have, first of all, an obligation to protect those students. The second thing is we have an obligation to the scientists and, and, and scholars working here to support the work that they do. That's, a public investment, but more importantly even than that, is we have an obligation to communicate what goes on in, in this university. A public university has to be public in its sense of communicating usable, useful research to a community. And, and, and this is important now because the very foundations of, of knowledge, the very faith that we have as a people in data, in investigation, is being undercut every single day. You know, it, it, it has been a tradition of long standing that the State Department briefed the President every single day. And there's not been one State Department briefing since this President came into office. There is a long standing tradition of policy about the environment being based on science and we have put in place in that agency someone whose very ambitions for the, for, for the position of the Environmental Protection Agency is to eradicate it. And you can go down the line where not just policies that we disagree with, but an approach to policy making, an approach to public discourse, which is, you can only say, antithetical to the very foundations of the institution that we're in right now. And so I think our speakers will have particular things to say about this. But what I'd like to say is, is that I'm proud that in this moment that we come together, not just as scholars, not just as students, not just as people who are interested in these, but as the embodiment of this historic institution. And because we are a historic institution, in some ways the embodiment of the whole ideal of public education, the idea that we are as a society are better off if we invest in um, the education of the whole. And this is not just for the benefit of the students who pass through these doors and the families and the children that will benefit from their education. It's because if we invest in the education of the whole people, we invest in the basic faith that knowledge and facts and science matter, should matter in the formation of a public policy. Um, so this is, I think, today, we're gathered here in some fundamental way to reiterate our mission statement. And so I'm pleased to have you here as, a, as, as an audience. I'm grateful, as I said, to the organizers of this, and, and, and so happy that we have these three distinguished guests to 
to speak on this forum. So, thank you all. Can you hear me? Hi, uh, I'm Michal Degel. I'm the director of the Rifkin Center for the Humanities and the Arts here at City College. Um, and um, so this, this event started as a conversation between me and my colleague, and um, we were thinking about what is the role of the university in the current political climate? And um, an obvious answer is that university seeks truth in a post-truth era. But that's a little bit of a kind of soundbite answer because we know that truth in the university and elsewhere is debated, contested, uh, and, and uh, by individuals, by groups, and by nations. And um, in fact, the critique of given truth has been part and parcel of the humanities and the social sciences at least since the 1960s. So I was thinking that perhaps one place where the university can start is not with the affirmation of truth, but with the affirmation of a common destiny. And by common destiny, I don't mean it in the kind of make American great again, fake nationalistic way, but um, in, the w in, th in thinking about the ways in which we are all in this moment together in some way. Recognizing differences, recognizing inequalities, but also recognizing that uh, we're all in this together. And I saw this, uh, so um, the philosopher Rosie Briadotti um, ha has this um, in her book, and she, sa she said something that I thought was very appropriate for this moment, we're all in this together, but we're not one. And I think that's a very good way of capturing this moment, we're all in this together, humans, animals, Leonardo da Vinci's dog, um, we are environmental activists, climate de change deniers, citizens, immigrants, we're all affected, citizens and immigrants, not only immigrants are affected by, by, um, by what is happening, but also citizens. They're not affected equally, but they are affected. And so um, I think that's one place where we can start thinking about these things. The certain second area, where I think the university may intervene in the current political moment is to facilitate, encourage, and propagate research-based debate. And it's actually astounding how much conservative critique and anger really has been waged at the liberal university. So the, the university figures in, in, um, in the imagination of the, in, of the right wing in a very big way. Um, and I'll just read you very quickly a few pieces by um, New York Times columnist Maureen Dowd. So Maureen Dowd, on Thanksgiving, two weeks or so after the election, goes home to her, goes to her brother's home for Thanksgiving. Um, and her brother, Kevin, uh, whom she describes as employing an affluent, educated suburbanite who has what he calls election therapy guide for liberals. So she, she goes to see uh, her brother, and this is the first thing she, on the Thanksgiving table, is Trump champagne alongside the turkey. So her family is celebrating while she is very upset. Um, and this is the message that Kevin Dowd has for liberal readers of the New York Times. And he says, the election was a complete repudiation of Barack Obama, his fantasy world of political correctness. A political correctness, a term that's kind of taken from academia. The politicization of the Justice Department and the IRS and out of control EPA, and again, something we'll be talking about, the neutering of the military, his non-support of the police, and his fixation on things like transgender bathrooms, which again, things that came out of gender studies and academia in general. Preaching and pandering with a message of inclusion, the Democrats have instead become a party where <coughs> incivility and bad manners are taken for granted, rudeness is routine, religion is mocked, and there's absolutely no respect for a different opinion. And again, Democrats, elite universities, liberal arts universities, and so on. Here is a short primer for the young protesters of Trump's victory. If your preferred candidate loses, there is no need for mass hysteria canceled midterms, and again, as if all Trump's voters are college students, right? 
safe spaces, crime rooms, or, or group crime or screens. And that's one of the 50 colleges mandate one semester of Western civilization. Maybe they should rethink that. So all of this anger at the, at the university. So where, where do we go from here? Um, does the university defend its former practices? Does it look for new practices? Um, how does it deal, I think, with the real, I think, rage and re tone of revenge that seeps beneath this ironic, these are ironic words. Um, so these are some of the things that I would like to, to open up here, directly or indirectly, and, and hopefully in a series of conversations that will happen throughout the semester and the next semester and so on, as needed. Uh, so the format of today will be, um, each speaker will speak for about 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, then there'll be 15, 20 minute Q&A, a little break, there's food outside, there are bathrooms, there's water, uh, and then we'll come back for the next speaker, there'll be five speakers. And we're going to start, actually starting, get my notes. We are going to start with our first speaker, um, Dr. Judith Stein, who is um, an American Distinguished Professor of American History here at City College and at the CUNY Graduate Center. Professor Stein worked on or works on African American history, social movements, labor and business history, and political economy. Um, she's, she's written for the New York Times, for the Sense, Village Voice, The Nation, and her last book, I believe, is, is called Pivotal Decade, How the United States Traded Factories for Finance. Thank you. In an election that had many bizarre features, it spawned a lot of exotic explanations. I'm going to take a completely different approach. I think Trump's victory was embedded in the history of the last 40 or 50 years and can be explained and needs to be explained if anyone is to uh, formulate an opposition. After I do that briefly, I'm going to talk about three things. One, what the numbers tell us about its meaning. Second, what the contradictions are within what I call the Trump GOP coalition, because I think there are two formations here. And finally, what the assumptions of the opposition strategies, of which there are two, what these assumptions are, which will help us choose which one, uh, which one is better. If you want to place our situation in the broadest context, the Trump victory is part of a worldwide protest against globalization with American characteristics. That story has long and deep roots in the United States, even though the word globalization is quite recent. When Trump told Americans last week that he was president of the US and not the globe, he was critiquing past policy. Now, when I use the word critique with Trump, I don't mean an academic critique. I don't even mean a politician critique. What I do mean is Trump, and I, I know this is a majority, and I don't mean it as, as such, but I think it is a demagogue. And you know, what's important to remember about demagogues is they put their finger on real problems, but their solutions are often bogus. So my argument is he has put his finger on a wrong, uh, excuse me, on, on a problem which has been ignored, but his solutions are bogus. Now what do I mean, uh, what do I mean by this? So on the one hand, he will criticize globalism. And on the other hand, he will ask for a huge increase in the military. I mean, that is a contradiction. But of course, he's not a systematic thinker. OK, so this is, this is where I'm going. Let me briefly summarize why I think he has a point here. After World War II, both parties granted Cold War allies access to the huge American market, even if it meant harming specific industries and permitted discrimination against American exporters to cement these Cold War alliances. The US was a global power. 
George Ball, President Kennedy's Undersecretary of State, said, quote, we Americans can afford to pay some economic price for a strong Europe. Providing Japan access to the U.S. market during the same period when Europe mostly banned its products was similar. American elites believed that without access to the American market, Japan would turn to China or the Soviet Union. Initially, because the U.S. was so much richer than Europe and Japan, it did not seem there would be a great price for it. But as Europe and Japan recovered and as oil became more expensive in the 1970s, such global priorities became possible. Nonetheless, the policy was maintained and expanded. In 1977, Jimmy Carter said, quote, free access to U.S. markets is a matter of ranking importance for our allies and almost all the developing countries of the world. His NSC had added that for the sake of the global order, we must be prepared to undertake the, quote, necessary sacrifices. Even after the Cold War ended, Germany's president told President George Bush in 1992, the size and strength of the American market is of vital importance to the rest of the world leading with us. This is the factual basis for Trump's critique. Then, beginning with the NAFTA in 1993, the American government went a step further by making it easy for corporations to offshore jobs to developing countries to reduce labor costs and enhance profits. This was to be a solution to America's competitive problem, which Reagan changes had not solved. Again, there was an opposition. A majority of Democrats opposed Bill Clinton's NAFTA. Still, neither the old nor new dissent reached presidential campaigns until this year. In 2016, for the first time in U.S. history, two insurgents challenged bipartisan global investment and trade policy. Bernie Sanders out of the left and Donald Trump from the right. You might ask, why now? And why in both parties? The insurgencies were propelled by the Great Recession, which offered tempting targets, especially the banks and the political elites that supported the bailouts. The swift recovery of Wall Street and the stagnation of many main streets fingered the role of financialization, which led to increasing disconnect between stock market performance and the real economy, with large rewards going to firms that undertook asset stripping, outsourcing, and offshoring. The combination of globalization and financialization produced a new class of owners and those who serviced them in global cities and growing insecurity and casualization of employment in the bulk of the middle and working class. Even elites acknowledge the growing inequality. This has been the weakest recovery since World War II. Currently, U.S. growth is, is sluggish, 1.9% in the last quarter, and wage stagnation continues despite relatively low unemployment. So why did insurgency win among Republicans and not Democrats? Every election combines deep changes and random contingent events. Initially, it seemed as if Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio, establishment Republicans, would win the primary, which initially had 17 contestants. Donald Trump was such an outlandish, unlikely candidate that his rivals directed their arrows at other competitors. When establishment Republicans recognized the situation, it was just too late. In contrast, the Democratic elite early on rallied around Hillary Clinton, and unlike the GOP, the Democratic Party had a wall of superdelegates to protect it. The Republican Party does not have a superdelegate. I suspect that they will change the rules for the next time that Trump, you know, screws up. Okay. Still, Trump did not win simply because he was lucky. The deep forces of the Great Recession disrupted the GOP coalition to permit his victory. Since the 1960s, the Republican Party was basically composed of 
suburban white middle class, small business people, professionals and managers, and a minority of older white workers. But Republican economic policy, free trade, deregulation, liberal immigration policy, and low tax policy were mainly determined by the big multinational corporations. The Bush and Obama bailout of the banks damaged this alliance. And the result was the Tea Party. The Tea Party was an alliance of older, white, suburban, small business people, professional and manager, who railed against what they called corporate welfare. They joined with libertarian capitalists like the Koch brothers, who saw this as an opportunity to defeat the Affordable Care Act, Vermont Care, and privatize Medicare and Social Security. More mainstream capitalists tolerated this as long as the Tea Party targeted unions and social services. This alliance reached its height when Republicans won the House and deprived Democrats of their supermajority in the Senate in 2010. They were helped by the 9% unemployment rate, which basically had not budged since Obama took office. Unlike the political establishment, the Tea Party right supported stricter immigration controls and wasn't phased by the possibility of federal credit default. In contrast, a large part of corporate America supported immigration and immigration reform. High-tech industries wanted access to skilled foreign professionals and labor-intensive sectors like agriculture, construction, landscaping, domestic service, childcare, healthcare, and hospitality relied upon low-wage, vulnerable immigrant labor. Both the Business Roundtable and the Chamber of Commerce, the leading business organizations, opposed deportations. They wanted reform, a guest worker program, and some path to legal status. The uneasy alliance between the party, the Tea Party, and traditional elites ended in 2013 over the budget and immigration reform. President Obama had negotiated a grand bargain with the Republicans. Flushed with their victory in 2010, the GOP felt it was strong enough to legislate its agenda, and President Obama believed he had to acknowledge the burden. So Obama agreed to historic cuts in the federal government and social safety net in exchange for increased federal taxation. In the end, Speaker John Boehner withdrew the offer because the Tea Party opposed. So, you know, you use words. You, you used in your in your talk. You used words like demo, uh, populist demagogue. That was one of the phrases that stuck out. Um, uh, I just wonder. I, I guess what I'm wondering is, what, what is your sense? Yeah, yeah, do, we need, um, do we need new labels? God, I I deliberately tried. I couldn't in that example avoid using it, and I thought many times before using it, in, in part because, you know, it's a pejorative, obviously. You know, and I wanted this to be more analytic, you know, so, uh, you know, but the other thing is, I avoided this because I am sick and tired of hearing from people who are in fascist America. You know, so I, I said, you know, Let's not label it. First of all, let me put it this way. You know, we thought, you know, he's just an office. It's hard to figure out, you know, where this is going. But I think the implication of my argument is that those who, who label him a fascist are wrong. Okay? That, you know, although it's his particularities, if you look at the program, you know, it is partly mainstream Republicanism and partly economic nationalism. You know, and maybe that's not a very elegant way of, you know, of putting it, uh, putting it, you know, it, it, you know, it, it, it together. But it seems to me that you know, it's not a unique speech. You know, it, we're not in a Trump era, first of all, or we're not in, you know, Trumpism, to me, has no meaning. 
But if you, okay, so if you suggest that there is an element of mainstream republicanism and an element of economic nationalism, what about the sort of ethno-nationalism? Yes, so both, both, absolutely. He combines both the economic nationalism and nativism. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. He, he incorporates it, and of course, by incorporating it, he enhances it. Absolutely. Okay, um, so one further question, then I'll open things up. So, so there's been a lot of um, uh, attention given to Trump's success, and, 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 and Professor Stein dwelt on this um, in her talk, Trump's success in winning over voters formerly in the, in the Democratic camp, including um, labor union um, voters, um, which have traditionally been part of the Democratic constituency. Um, so I, I guess I'm wondering what your sense of is, uh, what your sense is of the future of unions, politically speaking. I mean, what, where will the key battles be fought around labor? Um, well, right now there is an important potential strike going on in, in Mississippi, in a Nissan flag, which is 80 percent black, which Bernie Sanders went to, a few other people went to. If this uh, this doesn't mean. And then, well, why am I talking about this with you know with unions? Because in general, white workers in unions are more liberal democratic than not. So if you have fewer white workers in union, you have you know you know fewer opponents you know to the to the Trump vision. But you see what I would stress is the attraction that these workers had to Trump for talking about jobs. You see, to, to me, on that issue, it's the Democratic Party that's got to get its act together on this issue. The, the quote from Chuck Schumer, that we don't care, we don't need these people. You know, the party of Franklin Roosevelt? I mean, come on. You see, that is, and, and, and of course, this is what I mean by its closeness to Wall, the party's growing closeness to, to Wall Street and the financial sector, you know, in general. Okay. okay. So let me open it up. Any questions for Professor Stein? Yes, here. Professor Stein, thank you. That was a beautiful talk. Um, my question is regarding Trump and his business. Hey, wait, excuse me, it's what? Trump and his business, as we all know, he stepped into office. Trump and his business? His business. Uh, business. Oh, his business. Yes, yes. As we know, he stepped into office and had to relinquish publicly the relationship between him and his business, but I can't imagine, nor have I seen any um, stoppage between this. Between your research and findings on the greater political economy in the uh, political realm, do you find, have you found anything within the relationship to be had between Trump and his business and integrating it into this new global system, this new economic patriotism, as we call it, internationalism? I'm sure someone must have done research on this. I, uh, all I know is what you can read it in the newspapers, you know, that his hotels are global, or his branding, remember, you know, he doesn't so much uh, build hotels, but brands them. You know, are global, and so and uh, that may be, you know, as well, you know, an, uh, another kind of, uh, you know, contradiction, you know, within his own being. But uh, I don't have, you know, any anything to, and you know, I am less persuaded that that's the key to understanding Trump, you know, than other, uh, you know, than other phenomena. I mean, you know, his. Role as businessman, I mean, he clearly has a penchant for rich businessmen. He likes it, okay? Uh, but more than that, I, I don't see. I mean, the other thing is that I think his, um, his, his lack of knowledge of government is partly a function of the fact that he has been a businessman and he really doesn't know. You know the way government functions. I mean, uh, independent of, of his intentions, I mean, it, it shows a lot of that. But I, I, I can't add more to uh, his uh, 
business dealings, and, and, I, and I sort of don't think that's key to understanding where he's coming from. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is, do you think that the, the uh, degradation of American public education since 1968 has coincided with these political phenomena? Um, and, and, and coincidentally, at the same time, uh, the greater improvement of higher education in this country. Um, and also, what your opinion is of the work done by uh, the Berkeley sociologist, uh, I think her name is Arlie Hoxhoff. Uh, I, I don't know her work, sorry. Well, she recently did a book about time. She, about some five years that she spent in Louisiana talking to Trump voters and doing the very thing that you were talking about Democrats not having done for the past several years. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But uh, I would ask you to comment you, you on You see, on, well, on my, my, the implication of both of your question and what I would say is that the notion that Trump voters are um, Trumpites, you know, are true believers, I mean, the little stuff I have heard from people interviewing them, they're, they're much more like transactional voters. Meaning, you know, if he can bring back jobs, I'm all for him. But if he doesn't, there's another guy running next time. So to me, that that gives me hope. You know, you know, it's not that they're true believers, or at least the ones that swung this election. You know, obviously there are Trump true believers. I mean, that's, yeah, that's true, uh, you know, of any, of, 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 of any, uh, uh, of any politician. Um, now, your first question on the, the decline of public education since 1968. Certainly doesn't help. I mean, it's, it's certainly, you know, it can't predict you know, what happens in one year, you know, but if the argument is that the, this, these kinds of separations, encourage this kind of behavior, you're absolutely right. Yeah. If, you're, if you're talking about this thing turning around anytime soon, look well, how many years they've taken to destroy it. Well, let me put it this city. way. That, you see, here is where I don't think there's a new normal. I think we are, you know, I, I, I think it depends a lot. You know, for instance, before I came here, you know, there's this new Republican Obamacare thing. And Reverend Norris says, nobody likes it. Even within the Republican Party, I mean, they won't be able to do this. In other words, so the amount of damage, yes, I don't want to underscore, you know, the amount of damage that they can do and the psychic damage, you know, that they can do to immigrants and their families, I, I don't want to under, underestimate that. But all I mean to say is, it's not so easy to change things in America. You know, the left has often discovered this, and Donald Trump it will also. You know, so, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think the next six months will be critical. In the sense, how does their health care thing go? What happens to tax reform? Whether in infrastructure, will ever get done. He's already postponed it a year, and that was the issue that supposedly drew these former Democrats, and he's postponed it. You know, what's happening on the job front? I mean, is he really going, going to uh, uh, um, you know, renegotiate the NAFTA and, and deal with uh, China? Now, actually, I hate to say that, though, I hate to say, he's got three very good people on the trade issue who know a lot. One of them had worked with Democrats and the ALCIO. You know, so it is possible, but as I mentioned, he's got these kind of people, but then he's got Goldman Sachs people. You know, who you know, who is gonna win out within? 
So there are conflicts between the White House and the Republican Congress, and within the White House, between the, what I call the economic nationalists and the Goldman Sachs globalists. And at this point, I mean, I suspect on this issue that the Goldman Sachs people are going to win. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, that's the point. That's, that's the point. That, you know, but, you know, at least if the issue is raised, yeah, yeah, you know, it, 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 but, but if they do, then the amount of damage he can do on other issues is, 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 is going to be small. You know, because he came to power on the basis of an economic nationalist program. If he, he doesn't deliver, well, people are not going to vote for him again. You know, yeah. Oh, I was wondering, we, oh. we have time for one more quick question. And I have to. So you've been mentioning that Donald Trump has sort of uh, got a split between his uh, more working class supporters and his uh, more, you know, business and globalism oriented uh, workers. So, do you think he's going to, one way or another, end up alienating one of those two groups? And if not, which of the two do you think the Democratic Party will try to pick up? Because they're going to want to side with either the globalists or the, uh, the blue-collar workers. Which one do you think they're going to try to pander to? Who, who is they? The Democratic Party. Well, that depends That depends upon what de Democratic, I mean, you know if, if the Sanders forces in the Democratic Party are strong for what the choice will be. You know, if the Clintonites, I mean, they have a record on this issue. You know, they are globalists. You know, so, you know, you know, you know, the last part of what I said was they argue that they don't need the working class because they can appeal to minorities on the basis of race which, of course, the Republicans can't. And that will satisfy minority. My argument is that that won't. But, you know, who is to say? I mean, well, I was right in the last election, but, but you know, you, you, ne you never know. Uh, you know, in, in the case of Donald Trump, in part because he has never had a history of soliciting working class support, you know, it would lead me to believe that when push came to shove, you know, Goldman Sachs would win just because there's very little in his record that would, you know, I mean, look, it could prove me wrong, but, but uh, you know, that's the only basis, you know, that, I mean, he has yielded again and again on these issues. You know, and uh, uh, prescription drugs. Yeah, he said, you know, we're going to bargain the price is down. He yielded when confronted or when surrounded by um, pharmaceutical executives. You know, so where is that issue? And that, of course, is a very popular, important, uh, important issue. Okay. Uh, I'm afraid I hate to I hate to uh, stop this line of question because I think there's lots more to be said, but we do have to move on. So let's give Professor Stein. Thank you very much, professor of American History. He just joined us um, from uh, Columbia University, where he's a member of the Society of Fellows. Um, he is going to be um, this talk is going to be based on his uh, newly published book. Uh, expelling the Poor, uh, Atlantic Seaboard States, and the 19th Century Origins of American Immigration Law. Uh, is an expert on anti-immigration uh, sentiment and nativism uh, in America, and he's going to be making connections between that history and uh, contemporary uh, events. Uh, this is a book that uh, literally just appeared, I think, last month. Late January. Late January. Uh, you know, uh, literally hot on the Hello. Uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Steckel and Kevin um, for inviting me to this uh, uh, very important event. And of course, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, 
joining us um, this evening. Um, I am a historian of the United States and especially American immigration. And tonight I want to talk about, um, I want to um, discuss how um, we can put the recent um, executive order, presidential executive order on immigration in a historical perspective. So um, as probably many of you know, um, on January 27, uh, President Donald Trump uh, issued an executive order, uh, which was uh, actually revised just yesterday. And essentially, uh, the executive order did two things. One was to one is to uh, ban the entry of immigrants from um, um, particular uh, countries, predominantly Muslim countries. And then, secondly, uh, the executive order also suspended the immigration of refugees, entry of refugees. Uh, among many things, uh, one particularly important thing about this executive order is uh, how the theme of national security is articulated. Um, here's the, the passage from the uh, executive order. It said, in order to protect Americans, the United States must ensure that there was an admission to this country uh, do not be a hostile attitude toward it and its uh, founding principles. Now, um, this whole thing, the national security, um, is not entirely new, uh, historically speaking, um, in the history, in, in history of um, the immigrant sentiment in the United States. And my, my talk today is really based on this uh, theme. So, um, throughout the U.S. history, uh, we see uh, rises of anti immigrant sentiments uh, at various moments. And many things uh, are, many things contribute to the rise of nativism in the U.S. One is religion, obviously, uh, the Catholics, uh, Jews, and uh, more recently, uh, Muslims. Uh, their entry really uh, provoked anti immigrant sentiment. And also, uh, race and ethnicity are very important. Uh, early uh, in the 19th century, when uh, a large number of Irish uh, arrived in the United States, especially Irish Catholics, uh, and the Irish sentiment uh, became really strong, especially uh, among Anglo-Americans. And then in the late 19th century, when uh, Asian immigration, especially Chinese immigration, uh, expanded, um, uh, the, the kind of exotic Asian race, you know, their, their presence, their presence really uh, triggered the rise of nativism. And then um, later on, um, Mexican immigration did a similar thing. And of course, there's been more dimension of economics uh, in Native American nativism. The, the, the threat of job, job competition, alleged threat of job competition, was a major theme, as well as the poverty of uh, immigrants, which, was my, which is my biggest topic, actually. But the point here that I want to make here, here is that um, all these things, religion, racism, ethnicity, economics, are Consistently translated into the into the theme of national security, they are they are consistently translated into national security discourse. Now you can say that uh, immigration control was framed as an act of national security to hide, conceal the underlying racism, prejudice, ethnic prejudice. But uh, my, my point here is is to show the consistency of the, of this theme um, um, through through the long history of Americanism. And I want to show you some kind of cases uh, in which the notion of the theme of national security was uh, used, uh, the, the play, the, the, the roles of national security play um, in, uh, in American nativism um, from, from late 19th century, from late 19th century onward. So my first um, uh, case is uh, Irish immigration, especially the um, immigration of Irish Catholics in the mid 19th century. So as a result of this famous potato famine in Ireland, the United States uh, uh, received a large number of uh, heavily impoverished Irish immigrants. And the, their Catholicism became the kind of first uh, target, of, became the first subject of American nativism. And here we uh, have a quote uh, in the anti-Catholic anti propaganda. Throughout uh, Catholicism's whole construction, there is not a single element in uh, sympathy with our free, energetic, and soul-inspiring institutions. Um, it's interesting um, here to, to see the parallel between anti-Catholicism and anti-Muslim today. You know, uh, it, today uh, the popular uh, nativist discourse says uh, there is nothing uh, compatible, you know, um, in, in, 
Islam with uh, Christianity, right? So there's a you know, cultural war between Christianity and the Muslim. That was kind of a popular line of discourse today. Uh, back then, in the 19th century, the target was uh, Catholicism. And um, I, I wanted to uh, pay attention to the, the title of, of this uh, nativist publication, uh, the Defense of, of the, the Double Dove, uh, uh, Defense of American Policy. Um, and one of the kind of popular phrases used in this time period is uh, popery or papism, uh, which is a kind of famous uh, slogan uh, implying that uh, the Catholics were uh, having conspiracy, developing conspiracy to overturn American democracy with a despotic uh, hierarchical uh, structure, a uh, uh, hierarchical despotic Catholic Church. And the, the, this this discourse easily developed into the notion that uh, the United States uh, was being threatened uh, by the, the army of Catholics. Here's a propaganda poster against the, the Catholic Church or Catholics, the Catholic priests, uh, and also uh, implication is uh, anti-Irish. Here we literally see that uh, a group of priests, Catholic priests, were kind of crawling to the American shore, and their uh, hats were you know, that made them, made them, the priests appear like, a, you know, uh, alligators. Um, and the, the American um, children were uh, apparently kind of scared by the arrival of Catholic priests. So um, the, 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 in this religious discourse here as well, uh, the, the theme of national security and that the threats that the United States was facing from foreigners uh, was very visible. Now, the Catholicism or religion was not the only arena where anti-Catholic sentiment, anti-Irish sentiment uh, assumed its national security kind of dimension. As I said, many of the Irish were really poor, um, and many of the uh, Irish uh, became a recipient of charity, public welfare. Uh, they became uh, charity recipients. And this, this economic dimension as well was really converted, converted to, translated to the uh, national security discourse. Here we see uh, this nameless image uh, describing that uh, uh, the entire poorhouse uh, is being shipped from Galway, Ireland to the United States, and uh, the inmates in, in this poorhouse will be uh, will become burdens on uh, American taxpayers. So just like today, uh, neighbors say that uh, illegal immigrants were burdens on American taxpayers, um, they were going burden. Um, the poor Irish, destitute Irish, were called uh, literally uh, leeches uh, upon our taxpayers. Here I'm quoting uh, 19th century native, native, native sports. And uh, some states, especially Massachusetts, uh, established, uh, developed a policy for deporting uh, destitute, destitute immigrants uh, from the United States as, as a matter of public policy. And once again, the, the issues of economic were understood as a matter of national security, national defense. Now, what kind of threat the, the poor Irish uh, were posing? The, um, the answer was that uh, the, the, the poor immigrants were kind of threatening uh, public treasuries um, by becoming paupers. And that's a kind of threat. Uh, that's, a, that's a threat to Americans' uh, economic security or, uh, you know, uh, economic life. And one important dimension here is that the US Supreme Court um, actually endorsed the states and you know, the American, Americans' right to protect themselves from uh, economic threat, uh, which, you know, the poverty of the uh, immigrants, which is equivalent to a foreign threat. So here's a Supreme Court uh, decision in, in a case uh, in 1849. And in this case, uh, the Supreme Court said states may guard against the introduction of anything which may corrupt morals or uh, endanger the health of or lives of their citizens. And states have the right to repel from the shore lunatics, idiots, criminals, and paupers as part of the sacred law of self-defense. So um, uh, let me just continue. I'll give you one more thing, uh, one more instance here. Uh, words from uh, a mayor of the city, uh, New York City, uh, from the world in 1855. So, as the national government had a duty to protect us from the, uh, foreign aggression with ball and cannon, so it is duty to protect us against an enemy more insidious and destructive that were coming in another form. Um, these quotes are really uh, important because, um, especially from the world, from the world, 
foreign aggression was not just the you know, foreign aggression could come, you know, be, uh, in forms other than balls and cannon, like direct military aggression, military invasion, um, paupers, like economic threats, um, or the, the people who would abuse America's tax money, um, they were equal foreign threats, and the states uh, must be protected this kind of you know, um, threat, just like in the wartime. So there is a, an equation um, between war, foreign war and immigration restriction against plural or uh, undesirable immigrants, pretty much throughout the 19th century, the, the mid 19th century, um, against the Irish. Another, uh, so another uh, group that I want to mention is Chinese and uh, the policy for excluding Chinese immigrants. In the late 19th century, um, the, the exclusion of Chinese became a major issue in American immigration policy. Now, the anti Chinese sentiment itself um, started to grow in the mid 19th century when the Chinese joined gold mining, the gold rush in California. But then, this anti Chinese sentiment uh, became particularly strong and it provoked a uh, you know, larger anti Chinese movement in the 1870s in California. And the slogan was uh, really straightforward the Chinese must go. And the American workers, including uh, Irish American workers and Irish immigrant workers, actually, uh, became the major proponents of Chinese ex exclusion. And their campaign resulted in the passage of, of the Federal Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, uh, which suspended the uh, entry of Chinese laborers. Now, this, this Chinese Exclusion Act uh, was the first federal law to restrict immigration on the basis of race and nationality. So um, this is not the first case of immigration control itself in the US. Uh, there have been you know, uh, a precedent for immigration control uh, prior to this time, but the Exclusion Act was the first law, uh, as I said, uh, restricting immigration on the basis of race and nationality. Now, the, when we look at the discourse on anti-Chinese, uh, the, the, the anti-Chinese discourse, uh, there is interesting uh, kind of convergence uh, of issues of uh, labor, race and police power. So um, one dominant argument, line of argument is why labor cannot compete with Chinese labor. The Chinese uh, immigrants work, uh, work for very uh, low wages to the extent that they, they would threaten um, uh, white labor, white employment. That's, that's a very major line of argument. And then here's cultural, cultural language, that's got cultural argument. Uh, the Chinese race and American citizen are in the state of antagonism, antagonism. Uh, he, China, the Chinese, you know, as they call, uh, he is not for us. Uh, he is not of us. So, uh, it's, so the labor issue is, is a kind of um, only one aspect of anti-Chinese uh, um, sentiment, and this racial dimension was very strong and actually a major one. And but at the same time, um, here's how the police power kind of. Um, uh, comes in in this anti-Chinese discourse. Again, the US Supreme Court said, uh, if therefore the government of the United States considered the, the presence of foreigners of a different race uh, in this country who will not assimilate to it us to be dangerous to its peace and security, their exclusion is not to be stayed. So once again, uh, the presence of the, uh, the Chinese was regarded as a threat to peace and security um, of the nation. And uh, this sentiment um, was very uh, and deeply uh, related to the labor issues and race issues, but uh, you see here consistency of the same uh, notion, same theme, um, even though the targets were different, you know, whether not, uh, Chinese or Irish, uh, the theme is really consistent. Now, I want to also um, move on to a very important development uh, um, in American immigration discourse. So, there are several consequences uh, of, of, of this uh, national security discourse in American immigration, American immigration policy. And one very important consequence is uh, the rise of what immigration scholars call the, the plenary power doctrine in immigration. Uh, plenary power, the plenary the adjective here uh, means uh, you know, uh, very strong, absolute, um, so, so it's a really, it means you know, very strong power, absolute power uh, over issues of immigration. And this doctrine emerged um, as a result of some court cases in the late 19th century or early 20th century against the, uh, over, over the, uh, the admission of Chinese and uh, 
the Japanese Asian immigrants. So the doctrine uh, basically uh, assumes that as a, as a matter of national sovereignty, Congress immigration policy and executive branch of authority to enforce the law is beyond judicial oversight for constitutionality. Okay? Um, this, is a, uh, this sounds complicated, but the implication is tremendously huge and important. Um, essentially, uh, the doctrine assumes that um, Congress can do anything uh, with immigration. Um, and the Congress immigration policy uh, should be, will be regarded as legitimate, even though otherwise such policy will be regarded as, a, as constitutional. So the, uh, it's, it's not entirely beyond the, beyond the uh, judicial oversight constitutionality, but the, the constitutional kind of oversight was very limited. Very, very limited in, in, um, in the case of immigration. So the courts, for example, can refuse to review, review the immigration cases even though there was an apparent uh, violation of due, pro uh, due process or equal protection. Um, so, so within this doctrine, uh, immigrants had a very limited rights. And even though their rights were kind of violated in constitutionality speaking, uh, it's, it's, a kind of, it's very difficult um, to, to make the case uh, for the immigrants. And the due process violation um, uh, was a very uh, serious one. Um, but then here, in this, in, uh, I want to um, provide you some quote here, uh, a quote from one case uh, against the Japanese immigrants admission. So, even though you know, officials you know, can, can provide very kind of arbitrarily decisions, you know, they, they could arbitrarily kind of uh, exclude immigrants. But then, is even in such a case, uh, no, no due process uh, will be violated um, in, in enforcement of immigration policy because uh, the Supreme Court said, the decision of executive or administrative officers acting within power expressly conferred by Congress are due process of law. So the simple fact that immigrants are receiving decisions um, is, 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 can be regarded as a due process of law. So um, this is a really um, enormously, uh, it's a, no, this is an enormous doctrine. Okay? Um, now, uh, this doctrine has a history and it kind of has transformed over the years up to today, but uh, this is a very, uh, it's still influential uh, doctrine working in American immigration. Let me just wrap up a few things. Um, I'll wrap up my, wrap up my talk uh, in the next few minutes. So um, these, these 19th century developments really lay the foundations uh, for American immigration policy. And like I said, uh, the, the national security logic uh, remained really consistent and then it created a very important you know, uh, consequence, uh, which was not, uh, the, which was the uh, plenary power doctrine. Now, uh, the 20th century, if you look at the 20th century developments in immigration policy, uh, the, uh, you, you see the kind of centrality of, of, of these components, factors. Um, so, so the National Origins Act 1924 uh, is an act uh, which essentially uh, entirely suspended Asian immigration, which is regarded as um, you know, undesirable and threatening for various reasons. And US, uh, the U.S. Border Patrol was uh, founded in 1924, um, mostly to deal with Mexican immigration. Again, Mexican immigrants, you know, for uh, laborers, farm workers, um, they were regarded as uh, uh, mostly going to threat America's uh, security. And then, uh, precisely by the executive order, uh, Japanese American citizens were incarcerated during World War II for the national security reason and uh, the present power was regarded as um, kind of plenary. And then um, we have um, Operation Web Act uh, as a, in, 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 in the mid-20th century. Um, and here we, you know, I just used this um, newspaper um, from then, 1955, uh, U.S. Federal Hall's Border Invasion. I mean, so it's clear that it, uh, they have national security laws that kind of play a part uh, in the Operation Web Act. <laughs> so, what kind of observation um, can we make out of, out of this? Um, well, first of all, yeah, it's, 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 I hope it's clear by now uh, to everyone that uh, the national security logic is really central uh, in anti immigrant uh, discourse from the late 19th century onward. Like I said, you know, real issues of religion, race and ethnicity, uh, economics, uh, or I didn't mention this, but you know, 
um, sexuality, morality, um, uh, public health. There are multiple different factors that shaped the uh, immigration discourse uh, from 19th century onward. But um, if there's any organizing theme, if, if anything consistent, uh, that's really precisely the uh, national security one here. And we also have to think about the implication of regulation, regulatory laws and policy. You know, the, pol the law and policy didn't exist in social vacuum, and it, it always had uh, had a very poor consequences at social levels. So the pros prospective law and po uh, policy always you know, encouraged uh, violent, private violence and hate crimes. In the late 19th century, uh, uh, Catholic uh, convent was burned down uh, by a mob, and Catholics were kind of harassed and sometimes uh, uh, lynched. Um, the Chinese exclusion law really provoked a series of anti-Chinese violence, like the lynchings, uh, in very specific North, northwestern states. And uh, Mexicans had, uh, uh, went, and they went through a similar uh, uh, suffering as well. And I think this is very important because Particularly when we think about the last presidential election, when you know then candidate now President Donald Trump uh, said really nasty things, uh, which I believe I think he kind of you know uh, destroyed the you know, boundaries of, of appropriate language, right? And now I think you know some people are, uh, don't really hesitate to use bad nasty language and racist language in public sphere, and then that kind of you know obviously have. Uh, has encouraged uh, private violence against rights. Um, one more last thing is that uh, the, the plan of adoption that I mentioned um, is, is formidable. You know, I, I hate to finish my uh, presentation with a kind of pessimistic note here, but uh, uh, America's American policy is still operating under this uh, uh, doctrine, and then the president um, has some, you know, power to act on, on its, its authority. The, the, uh, a provision in America's international law actually gives the power um, to the uh, president to ban or remove you know, foreigners who are, who are perceived as a threat to national security. And that, that kind of power is really formidable. So um, these are the challenges that we have. Um, that is, you know, the legal doctrine, uh, the force court authority, and the presidential authority over immigration. So with that, with that note, I, I stop here. Thanks for listening. Okay, thank you very much, um, Dr. Kuroja, for that interesting talk. It uh, seems to me sadly ironic that the uh, political troubles of, of today surrounding immigration um, have increased interest in your scholarship, but that's often the way it works for us um, academics. Um, I guess you 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 end uh, you end your end your talk on a rather pessimistic note. I'm wondering. I, I, I guess I'm wondering if you can suggest any ways in which we might think about uh, what the future with respect to immigration holds that might be somewhat less dire. <laughs> to speak about that on the positive side. Um, there are things that, um, there are things to, ways to challenge uh, very rigorous parts and things to make immigration policy and law. Um, so the first point is that the issues of immigration were never monolithic. So I introduced the planet power doctrine as a really formidable power, but that's not the only thing that drives immigration. And uh, for example, uh, the Immigration Act, uh, the Immigration Act of 1950, uh, 1965 uh, prohibited the discrimination against immigrants on the basis of race, um, religion, things like that. Uh, so, so the um, uh, the current executive order um, apparently violates that th that principle, you know, no discrimination on the basis of race, uh, 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 race and religion, um, mo mostly. And also, um, you know, immigration scholars and the courts also mentioned that um, executive order kind of violates uh, the establishment clause of the Constitution, so that, uh, that's, uh, that's in the, uh, the First Amendment, you know, prohibiting the, the violation of guaranteeing religious freedom, you know, uh, given that 
uh, the executive order has a, a very apparent undiluted um, connotation. Um, uh, there, we can argue that you know, it, it violates like, the, this establishment clause. But it also, um, the Planet Power Doctrine itself, I, I want to be overly optimistic, but uh, the history shows that the Planet Power itself has uh, weakened, uh, be, be, has, be, has, has become weaker um, over, the, over the course of the 20th century. Uh, earlier, uh, the, the Planet Power, Planet Power Doctrine really denied almost entirely the due process of law. Uh, applicable to immigrants, but then the courts these days are more willing to recognize due process and equal protection uh, for immigrants in immigration cases. So uh, the courts were again never uh, monolithic in this sense. So there, there, there are ways to challenge um, the executive order. And then if this is the kind of legal solutions, uh, solution, you know, there are things we can do as citizens, students, uh, at the kind of civic levels. And you know, if US history tells something for us, uh, I think one of them is that uh, the popular protest, mass protest, does make a difference. Uh, the reform is not always perfect, and there's always other, there are always other factors for the policy to become it, but then um, still, I think popular protest um, does make some forms of difference. And then I, I think the uh, public schools, uh, higher education institutions, um, like City College, uh, should take the lead in this area. Okay, thank you very much. So we have uh, about 15 minutes. I'd like to request that you please keep your questions short and to the point. Yes. Uh, great, great talk, and uh, I get the big picture. Um, but I'm still asking myself, why is this happening? Is it just sheer unbridled racism? Uh, you didn't mention much about how economics play into this. I wonder if you could give us your interpretation as to why this is happening. Is it just white people uh, misbehaving, or what, what? what is it? I mean, the present is. You know, no, I, from the start, you showed uh, uh, Uncle Sam kicking uh, some uh -huh. Chinese people down. I mean, is it just? Is it just happening here also? Is it maybe uh, more international than we might recognize? I mean, we seem to be saying it's a U.S. problem, and maybe it's really not. Um, the answer is yes and no. It is a U.S. problem in, in certain, in, in many ways. Um, I, I think, it, so the nativism really um, arose from a combination of multiple factors, like um, religion, economics, and, and Ethnic racial prejudice, and it, uh, I can't just identify one single, you know, the decisive factor. But then, um, I, I think that uh, the founders, for example, uh, you know, back in the 18th century, uh, they didn't really imagine that U.S. society would become this diverse. And uh, the first first testing case uh, really uh, came with the arrival of the Irish. Um, the vast majority of them were uh, Catholics, and um, religion was was much more important in society than it is now, um, and so Protestant Americans uh, seriously felt that America's democracy would be overturned by this despotic Catholics. But then there is also an ethnic dimension as well. The many of the 19th century Americans were of uh, Anglo descent. You know, they descended from English uh, immigrant settlers originally, and especially in Massachusetts, uh, they were uh, descendants of Puritans who hated Catholics and Irish, the Celtic people. So um, when the poverty, when the poverty of immigrants, Irish ethnicity, uh, Catholicism uh, kind of came together, that's a that's a you know well enough foundation for the rise of uh, the eruption of Buddhism. And um, the same kind of observation can apply to Chinese case uh, and also Italian, Greeks, you know, Jewish immigrants uh, coming from uh, Eastern um, Southern Europe uh, in at the turn of the 20th century and uh, Mexico and Mexico as well were the reason. Other questions? Is there a split between because it seems like there's sort of two sides ideologically, or at least two prominent factors are the uh, you know national security. These people are dangerous, they're a threat to our way of life, and on the other hand, these people are taking our jobs, they're a threat to our financial stability. So it seems like currently one half is tied more to 
Mexican immigration and one half is tied more to immigration from uh, the Middle East. Like it's sort of separated into different groups. So these represent, do these two fears, can they be separated? Or are they fundamentally different and they just happen to converge sometimes? Or what's their relationship to one another? Um, that's a very good question. Um, you can say that, yeah, so the um, illegal immigration uh, was the economic, economic one, and uh, Muslim immigration is, uh, is a religious issue. And I think that distinction is correct. Uh, but at the same time, um, the, the broader notion of security, national security, like, uh, I mean, the broader uh, force to protect the United States from external, something external, uh, something externally, you know, some, something undesirable um, coming from outside, coming from outside the United States. Um, um, th that this, this notion is, uh, I, I think, universal in, in, in natives, I guess, uh, both forms of immigration. So um, we can distinguish, and that distinction is uh, totally uh, valid, but at the same time, um, you know, the fear of undesirable groups of people, like, you know, people on this other character, um, and, and, and the notion that they would kind of overturn American society. I think he, that in that sense, yeah, uh, I think the two forms of immigration kind of converge. So Professor Stein, um, where you spoke about um, the fact that corporate America actually as it supports immigration at the present moment. Um, and why did you can speak to the history of that and whether that could inadvertently be a force actually a force that could work um, against the president? So Native born Americans were, were again never monolithic and uh, especially the business sector sectors of uh, remain kind of critical of um, opposing immigration control um, pretty much up from the 19th century um, onward to, to, to this day. Um, the Irish immigrants were obviously a uh, very uh, important source of labor. Uh, mo many of them, the vast majority, majority of them were uh, allowed to land, uh, uh, in part because they were very important you know, source of labor. But then even in, in, in the, uh, the Chinese case, um, the Entrepreneurs, capitalists, you know, the owners of railroad company, companies, uh, they welcome Chinese labor uh, because it's cheap. And um, so the, uh, they're, they're, the, the capitalist group was the biggest opponent of, of, opponent of the Chinese exclusion policy. Uh, they they uh, remained uh, uh, against uh, Chinese exclusion policy pretty much. And even today, you know, there is, um, you know, restrictive laws, uh, the discriminatory laws, immigration laws in some of the southern states, southwestern states, Arizona, for example. But then there, the local business, you know, tourism, tourism you know, industry was very um, against um, that the, the discriminatory laws be, because it really harms the economy. And I'm sorry, I, I skipped uh, Mexican immigration in the early 20th century, but. Um, even though uh, the, the act in 1924 uh, really broadly suspended uh, restricted immigration, you know, it, it cut Asian immigration entirely and it reduced drastically immigration from Eastern European immigration. That law, the Immigration Act in 1924, 1924 uh, exempted uh, immigrants from Western Hemisphere from exclusion. That is to say, Canadians and Mexicans were allowed to enter the United States, even though it, even in this kind of restricted mindset, climate. Uh, the primary reason for this next exemption was that the farm labor of the farm companies um, in the Southwest desperately needed Mexican labor. They just cannot afford to lose uh, the labor force. So um, there's always a tension um, between um, the capitalist kind of greed for labor and also cultural, religious, you know, the, na na the native force uh, in, in, in your policy. We have time for one more question. Uh, thank you. Um, my question is concerning um, media culture, more specifically. Um, you know, the the real speed up of it in our current uh, in our contemporary lifestyle is unfathomable. 
Um, but this was not always the case, certainly in the 18th and 19th century, it functioned much differently. Um, but nonetheless, as, we, as you've given your talk, and you've said how different centralities of power have entered government, and how you see a different um, ethos as to who is crafting um, local, also national law against immigration. Um, but I'm curious to know how the, you know, one can wake up one morning and feel fear, hatred for, you know, their neighbor who might take their job. But I'm curious to know what's the relationship between media culture, it's spreading outward, towns, villages, and kind of how they were manufacturing fear, in a sense, to move national policy forward. Um, so there are, so back then, uh, the important media outlet was periodicals, uh, you know, pictorial, you know, magazines, the covers weekly, uh, you know, other national level magazines, and um, and they played a very important role in exaggerating, first of all, the uh, cultural, biological, alleged biological characteristics of immigrants, and there are a series of uh, derogatory cartoons, you know, the cartoons <coughs> that describe immigrants uh, in really der derogatory ways. Um, and, and that's actually part, part of larger US culture, you know, this, this uh, the cartoon, the derogatory cartoons started with the description of African Americans, you know, early in the 19th century, and that kind of tradition was inherited to uh, immigrants. And uh, some of the uh, periodicals are really stunning uh, with the, for its name, like one of them is, is what was called Wasp. Straightforward, uh -huh. um, you know, uh, wasp magazine, and uh, obviously, you know, the magazine really described non-wasp immigrants as super inferior and super undesirable, right? Um, so that's so, so that kind of you know magazines, uh, cartoons, I, I think, did drive even modest Americans, you know, Americans who would be otherwise tolerant of immigrants uh, toward native spots, and uh, also the 20th century as well. Um, you know, the images of uh, farm workers, of poor workers, uh, images of um, undesirable groups of people, the foreigners, uh, through reporters, you know, were circulated. And also the other side is that uh, the images of rapes, you know, the immigrant rapes, uh, were also circulated, uh, the photos of rapes, uh, especially during Operation Web Act. Uh, that created a kind of fear factor, you know, um, so that you know, immigrants uh, would feel that you know, they should not leave, uh, stay in the United States so that uh, they would self-report, right? Um, so, so this kind of fear propaganda was also a very important part of, I think, the larger nativist kind of uh, media use. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Grossman is um, <laughs> a professor of modern European and your, uh, German history. Uh, she teaches it at Cooper Union. She is also, I should mention, a form, an alum of this institution. She got her undergraduate degree here in 1973. And Two, but then I stayed till 73. So many, many years ago. Uh, she has great stories to tell about those days, <coughs> about the, the wild days of <clears throat> in the 1970s at City College. Anyways, um, uh, Dr. Bruskin is the author of, of numerous books amongst them. Um, most recently, uh, a book titled Crimes of War, Guilt and Denial in the 20th Century, and uh, that came out in 2002, and uh, subsequently um, her book Jews, Germans, and Allies, Close Encounters in Occupied Germany uh, came out in 2007. Um, she's helped many fellowships, um, and is a um, uh, uh, member of, of various uh, national and international academic organizations, uh, and she will speak to us today about, um, uh, well, she will offer us a, a, a perspective on, on, on contemporary events from, uh, from Europe. Particularly tumultuous time.
time, and, um, and I was from basically from 1969 to 1973. And, uh, and it's interesting, I mean, I just can't resist remarking that I mean, the, the gentleman over here was saying that you know, since 1968, public education has been in decline. And of course, um, you know, what we thought we were doing in 1968-69 was improving public education by, uh, by opening it up. By, you know, I mean, by opening it up to, through the black and Puerto Rican student strike of 1969, by the uh, women's movement, uh, by through the activism around Kent State, Cambodia, uh, agitation around, around the war, around establishing women's studies programs, um, uh, African American studies programs. So it's actually, I mean, in a sense, it was also an interesting moment where there was this kind of older tradition of City College, right, as the Harvard of the proletariat. And then there was that challenging moment of saying, well, actually, we want to be a different kind of Harvard of the proletariat. We also want to be, you know, a school that serves, uh, that serves the City College, that serves the community. And, and there were a lot of tensions and and conflicts around that. But it was also, I think, and I'm just, I don't know, I'm inspired by being here, none of which existed, of course, when I was here. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm realizing that it actually was that moment of being at City in, in the late 60s and the early 70s uh, that, that turned me into a German historian uh, because we were actually interested at that particular moment with the U.S. involved in imperialist wars, with these challenges coming uh, from um, <laughs> formerly, you know, sort of non-represented groups saying, you know, we belong here too. Ooh, that is not supposed to happen. <laughs> Something just like my season. Um, that, that, that we, we did think a lot about the question of fascism, right, that F word, uh, and, you know, how it came, to, you know, how did it come to power, what were the failures, particularly of the left, uh, that contributed to the triumph of, of, of fascism in Europe broadly and of national socialism in particular uh, in, um, uh, in, in, in Germany, and, and so those were questions that, that, that seemed very burning at the time, and, and that slogan of you know, never again, which you know, I think today often gets associated with you know, never again the Holocaust or never again genocide. And for us at the time, I think never again, which we used rather liberally, <laughs> that term, um, really meant never again a good German. You know, it didn't mean never again a victim. <clears throat> it meant never again a good German, quote unquote. In other words, that somehow it was what we had learned from history, we thought, was that it was important to sort of beware the signs to, uh, to resist as best one could uh, and, uh, and not be sort of drawn into situations that could contribute to the rise of fascism. And, and also, I mean, we started out with this discussion about uh, the role of the university. And I think today, you know, we think of the university as a place that is beleaguered by the forces that are, that, that see the university as a place of political correctness, that see it as a place that, you know, wants to, you know, deny uh, the right of conservatives to that is indoctrinating students in you know all these terrible things left wing thought you know thinking that the study of um, uh, marginalized groups is important rather than Western Civ as we saw. Um, whereas I think you know at the time uh, you know we saw it, yeah and, and so now it's like I think we feel a sense of kinship with the university as we're trying to defend ourselves. Um, and at the time, it was more it was more the other way around that we felt like we needed to fight the university in order to get it to open up. You know that sort of famous slogan of, of well, it was actually the Columbia '68 slogan, right? You know, work, study, get it, and kill. You know, that's not what we that's not what we what we wanted. 
So, um, and, and, okay, and Andrea said, I have too many stories, so I'm not going to wax, you know, sort of, oh, back in the day, right? Um, but, uh, but, I, but, but it is interesting to kind of think of, you know, those particular moments where, you know, the F word has, um, as it were, has, has arisen again. And, and, and I think that what, you know, Andreas and Michal had in mind was, uh, you know, for me to say a couple of things about uh, the, not, not, not the, not the parallels and maybe not even the analogies, but the sort of signals that might be useful, maybe, uh, in looking back at that particular history, I do think, I mean, we just heard this wonderful talk on, Ameri on the history of, uh, of American uh, of nativism and immigration. I, I do feel like much of what we're facing now can be located in the particularities of, of American history, you know, which I sort of gave up on at City College because I got so excited about my European history and had some fabulous professors. Uh, but um, so, but, but I think it is also undeniable that there are, and I'm sure I'm not telling you anything that you don't know, right, that, that there are these pieces of alt-right and sort of white nationalist um, media and, and, and propaganda and, and also above all symbolism, you know, Steve Bannon is a post, you know, post of war for this, uh, that, that draw directly from, you know, a European, you know, a kind of European fascist, you know, heritage and, 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 and use that, use a certain kind of language or, uh, or, or, or symbols uh, that uh, do come out of, out of the 30s. So, you know, so what does that, you know, what, you know, what, what does that mean? What, what do we make of that? Do we, you know, do we freak out? Say, oh, fascism is coming. I mean, I think Judy Stein made the point that she's seen people, uh, you know, using that term. And I and I tend to think that yeah, there's not a lot of purchase in arguing about, you know, is this fascism? You know, how is this like Nazi Germany? I mean, the only person who seems to have said it's like Nazi Germany so far really is you know Donald Trump when he was saying the FBI was um, uh, you know treating him um, or the intelligence community. Uh, but uh, you know, clearly people are you know asking you know, is this a, you know is there a kind of Weimar moment that we can recognize? Are there elements of a kind of fascist sensibility, fascist organization uh, that that might help you know that, that that we should look for, not because we think it's the same. It's obvious that history does not repeat itself. It doesn't. If it did, you know, it would be a lot easier to figure out. Um, but there are perhaps some some signs, some, some signals, some some elements, and uh, I think that you know just to, to sort of go through a couple of these of, of, of these elements. Uh, I mean, one thing, of course, that characterizes this collapse, right, of what was already, and that is actually different, I think, than what the U.S. is. I mean, what was already, you know, an extraordinarily fragile uh, and young republic. You know, people always talk about Weimar as the republic that nobody wanted. In fact, that was the first book I ever read in uh, German history class at City College. It was called The Republic That Nobody Wanted, and it referred to Weimar. Um, is this notion of, so of a, a kind of loss of faith uh, uh, in liberal democracy. Uh, a loss of legitimacy for parliamentary democracy. <coughs> There's a historian named Mark Mazzaro who talks about this period of the late 1920s, the early 1930s, and he describes parliamentary democracy as a quote, deserted temple, melodramatic. Uh, but the sort of profound sense on the part of many people from the left and the right and sort of across the political spectrum uh, that that government within these structures of parliamentary democracy doesn't work. That it's paralyzed. That it's full of people yelling at each other and, and um, 
spewing propaganda, lies, a kind of polarization where people cannot meet, people cannot uh, work together, uh, that existing conventional political parties no longer meet the needs of uh, the people they claim to represent, and that there is very little possibility for forging the kind of workable consensus that governments actually do need in order to legislate, in order to give people the type of things, be it education, health, welfare, protection, uh, a reasonable conduct of foreign affairs uh, that, that we would expect from, um, from government. So uh, I think this, this, this element of, of crisis of legitimacy, a loss of faith, a loss of confidence in government as such, and, uh, and that the, that loss of faith or sense of legitimacy in government was kind of created by a vicious cycle in the sense that by, by 1930, because there was a profound economic crisis, much, much, much more uh, you know, dramatic than what we've experienced in this kind of slow motion crisis of, you know, that started in 2008. You know, when we heard about stagnant wages, we heard about, uh, you know, a slow recovery. But, I mean, this was the Great Depression. This was, you know, massive unemployment. This was an unemployment that affected every, at least every other family in one form or another, sometimes indirectly. Um, so that by, by 1930 already, the kind of democratic coalition that had been ruling Germany, sort of moderate socialists and sort of centrist parties, doesn't, the details are not so relevant right now, um, essentially gave up because they had to make a decision about whether or not to continue the benefits that had been granted by this young sort of experiment in democracy, which was the Weimar Republic, which had in fact expanded cultural innovation, had expanded social rights, women had gotten the vote, Jews were now able to enter the civil service in a way that they hadn't before, uh, unions had gotten new powers in, order, in terms of negotiating wages and uh, there had been an expansion of health insurance, and in 1927, there had actually been the passage for the first time ever, before the New Deal ever came along, of unemployment insurance in 1927. And at the time that this unemployment insurance was passed, nobody thought that one would have mass unemployment, right? This was supposed to deal with normal unemployment. <coughs> By 1930, this unemployment insurance program is in complete crisis because, you know, sort of pushed by the stock market crash, all kinds of bank failures, uh, the the system was just under so much pressure that it couldn't it couldn't meet the needs of its clients, and people were getting angry not at the bosses, but at the government because the government wasn't able to fulfill its promise. And in that moment, the coalition government, which was led by a social democrat, sort of left-wing moderate socialist, they clutched. They said, we don't know what to do. Because if we meet the needs of our constituents who are screaming for more benefits, we're going to be fiscally irresponsible. We're going to go into more deficit financing. Everybody knew that back in 1923, after World War I, Germany had been struck by a horrific inflation. So everybody was terrified of inflation. They thought, we can't, we cannot have uh, deficit financing. You know, we have to balance the budget. But by balancing the budget, they understood that they were going to lose exactly the voters that they needed, namely the working class voters. And so, what did they do? Instead of figuring out what to do, they gave up. 
They said, ah, we don't know. And they called new elections. And exactly the worst moment, in a sense, when, you know, when, when the, the country is in upheaval, there's tremendous anxiety, there's tremendous fear. Uh, and in that moment, and it really was this sort of moment of, um, of, of these new elections after March 1930, it did seem like something fundamental shifted. So yes, you have these kind of long durees, and you can say, oh, there are all these long-term trends, and you know, they, 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 super dramatic change doesn't happen. But super dramatic change did happen. You know, I mean, within one election, the number of <laughs> Um, national Socialist deputies shot up from 12 to 107. And that meant, and again, this is a big, huge difference from today, that meant that you had people walking into Parliament wearing brown uniforms and swastikas and making very, very clear that they had no intention of respecting the rule of law or parliamentary, you know, parliamentary procedures. At the same time, to a lesser degree, the communist world. And it was at that point then that essentially parliamentary democracy stopped. And the country turned to rule by emergency decree, which was essentially executive order. Because there was, which we do not have in our constitution, though we, uh, I mean, we want <coughs> our president to be able to protect the national security, but there was a clause in the constitution that said in a time of national emergency, the executive branch can rule by executive degree. And that is indeed what happened from 1931. So it was this kind of moment uh, where it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. People had lost faith in the possibilities of government, but then government was so <coughs> disempowered and, and, and turned into depending on how you saw it, either a circus or a horror show, thinking about you know, these people in brown uniforms screaming at each other, that it was clear that it was something that couldn't be taken seriously. I mean, obviously I'm simplifying and overgeneralizing. Uh, but so, and it was at that point that I think that the, a couple of other things, just to um, sort of lay out a few more kind of alerts, a couple of other things I think really kicked in. Um, one was this term that I think we've been hearing a lot, but which again, I remember first encountering in my reading of a book that I first read at City College back in the day, um, called the, um, the Nazi Seizure of Power by William Sheridan Allen, you're not in, um, sort of a local history. And it, a politics of fear, a politics that it wasn't even so much the people who had actually lost their jobs, many of whom were turning um, actually to the left, um, who were looking towards a radical solution beyond political parties, beyond traditional <coughs> political parties, who were looking to this movement that was dynamic, that was performative, that had wonderful rallies, uh, that had, was able to use new media in a way that the older parties weren't, you know, that had really figured out how to use radio. Uh, that was for the first, they were, the Nazis were the first group to use the airplane for campaigning. Some of you may have seen the triumph, you know, triumph of the will, okay? Uh, that had sort of mastered the idea of using this new, faster media. Of course, it's nothing compared to the kind of media we have today, but at the time, it seemed a lot faster. Um, that also had mastered the idea of targeted propaganda. In other words, if you were, you, you, they, they would talk about certain issues to certain groups and other issues to other groups. And if it seemed, for example, that anti-Semitism wasn't necessarily the most important issue, they would simply not talk about it. That was something that people had to be willing to take on board, but it wasn't necessarily the main issue. So. There's, there's a kind of um, ability to propagandize. There's a degraded political discourse that plays on a politics of fear that says, you could be next. You might lose your job. Actually, you're still okay. 
which is, I think, again, the American historians and analysts, a lot of the you know, correctness, but I think we've been seeing a lot of that too, that a lot of the fear, for example, of immigrants or refugees is highest at times and places where there are the fewest. And, but, but the way that this um, sense of being able to exploit the politics of fear and then exploit also a notion of, I actually don't like this word, but um, <coughs> maybe it's useful um, the moment, uh, to exploit certain groups as quote unquote scapegoats, right? That, you know, it, 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 and, and, and if you're looking for, for, for groups to focus on, in this particular situation, there were always three groups because there was a legacy of defeat, right? This idea Germany had been defeated in World War I, but it hadn't been defeated on the battlefield. It had been stabbed in the back by these internal elements uh, that um, wished Germany evil, did not believe that Germany should win. Uh, we're not real Germans, right? We're not real Germans. And those three groups were women who were seen as having mutiny, as not having worked hard enough on the home front, uh, who had been agitated for their own rights, Jews who were associated with speculation, that international conspiracy of global capital, you know, when we hear the dog whistles now in certain um, rhetoric coming out of the Trump camp. Uh, who were seen as having you know, speculated and hoarded and not participated fully enough in defending the country in World War I, even though that was totally fake news and it was manifestly statistically not true, but there were enough media uh, outlets that propagated that, and also an organized working class. The organized working class, which then was able to gain, in a sense, from the republic that emerged out of it. And so using those, those people who had been accused of being the, the, having stabbed Germany in the back, in the back again, I said, these are the people who are threatening us. These are the people who are stopping uh, Germany from being able to overcome the shame, the shame of you know, the post-war, the Treaty of Versailles, the shame of defeat. Um, and that was always Jews, women, and and organized working class. And so, that the, the, and then this, this, this way of playing on people's fears also created a, a kind of secondary fear, if you will. I just have to keep track of time. Yeah, good. Um, a kind of um, secondary fear in politicians who kind of knew that this was not true that this was not evidence based, uh, but were fearful of the fear of their constituents, right? So, so not only do you have a politics of fear, but you have a politics of the fear of fear, which led to sort of moderate or non-Nazi right-wingers to hang their hat with this extreme group that they expected <coughs> fully to be able to control that they figured, look, you know, this guy is charismatic. He's going to be able to get votes for us. He's got, you know, he's got a movement, not just a party. Uh, there, are, you know, an ability to use media, an ability to stage rallies that we don't have. Uh, but it's okay. Don't worry, because we, you know, we're the elites. We really do control the banks. We really do control the press. Um, even though the story was that it was the Jews that were controlling the banks and the lying press, the liberal press, right? Um, and so they were willing to make those deals and let a representative of this party, which had been seen as a complete fringe lunatic party, there were plenty of people who listened to the Nazi speak and said, this guy's a loony tooth. Who could possibly ever vote for him, right? Uh, were willing to suspend their sense of anxiety about this and say, <coughs> he's going to make sure that 
the gains, the social welfare gains of the Weimar Republic are rolled back. He's going to make sure that this decline of Germany internationally will be stopped, that the threat of communism will be contained. And then, once he's chancellor, we'll have the majority of the seats in the cabinet and we'll control it. And indeed, at the beginning, it was a completely hybrid government. And that's, I guess, where I would stop um, for now to say that the first cabinet only had two national socialists in it, plus the chancellor, right? It just so happened that one of those national socialists was the minister of interior, which meant that he was in charge of prisons, the terror apparatus, the security apparatus. Uh, and then once in power, once they realized that maybe they couldn't control it, they said, that's okay too, because he's basically doing what we want to do. And then what we see, and this, and this is, I think, the, to me, the sort of scary part, is that with an extraordinarily, extraordinary rapidity, within maybe six months, these institutions of civil society that were frayed, that were very frayed, basically were destroyed. The free press was destroyed. The unions were banned. Political parties were banned. <coughs> Other political parties. It happened really quickly. It happened with the acquiescence of the so-called reasonable right. It happened by destroying the spaces in which all of those people who were still there, who were opposed, who were actually the majority, who were actually the majority, you know, the, the Nazis never got more than 43% of the vote, even in an election that was after a lot of repression, after Hitler was chancellor. But it was very quickly possible to shut down the spaces in which people could organize, in which they could write freely, in which they could speak to each other, to set up wild concentration camps, to arrest people in the middle. And that happened even as life as usual went on. Yes, maybe there were banners in the street, but people still went to the movies. Hollywood movies still played. People still drank Coca-Cola. They, the, um, they went to their cafes. And unless you were directly targeted, for quite a long time, life went on. And that, to me, as I sort of try to sort of suss out, well, you know, what are the moments that are better anxiety producing for me now? Many. But also, how do we think about our own lives now? It's that balance between the fact that life went on. You know, it wasn't like, okay, this is it. <clears throat> life went on. And yet, very quickly, there was this kind of so-called synchronization that shut down the very real possibilities that did exist for a kind of so it's not going to happen like that, clearly. But I think there are some points that we might think about, and also points where we might think about, you know, where do we want to cut in? What are moments of where it's possible to resist? Thank you very much. I must tell you that I, I'm a German historian myself, and I, I'm inclined to be very skeptical of the um, analogy between what happened in Germany then and what's going on in the United States now, which is an analogy that is in the in political commentary all the time nowadays. But listening to you, Bettina, when you run that unemployment, new media, politics of fear, conspiracy theory, it all sounds very comparable to what's going on right now. Anyways, we are pressed for time, so I'm not going to pose any questions. I'm just going to open things up. We have time, I think, for, for two questions. So please keep your questions short and to the point. Who would like to address a question? Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to address the component of fear in your speech and how it ties into the university today where you think this should go. Um, you know, Trump by no means created the system of
slashing the humanities, um, but he did inherit it and did, uh, did now play a bigger role in slashing the Civil War. Um, so, you know, when speaking about Nazi Germany, we find that in the historiography, that's the name for the story of how historians are history, um, they sought to find truth within generalities. And it seems as though today this is where our, the duty of scholarship is for. But my question is regarding funding in that you find scholarship is now twisting, bending, so that it can be published, which is essentially changing the scope of how we even understand the past. Um, such themes as American exceptionalism, 9-11, terrorism, these are all, even within the Western um, tradition of European history and the Americas, um, is changing the scope of how we look in the past. How do you think uh, scholarship should start responding to this, you know, this problem where, you know, the publisher dies? Well, I don't know if it's just public. I don't know if it's publisher or dies so publisher much as it is, course. as we heard from our colleague in um, about you know, sort of the, 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 the what's happening, for example, with environmental policy, or just the whole idea of the sort of evidence of science and well, wanting to uh, protect uh, the, the, uh, the pursuit of, of knowledge and scholarship uh, that that I think it, it's going to require uh, a lot of very creative thinking on the part of universities in terms of, yes, where do you get your funding? Now, the US has the advantage as against Europe today also that for better and for worse, we actually don't have so much state funding, right? And so there are lots of you know, private, you know, there, there's private fundraising that to some degree one may have to turn to uh, in order to keep supporting the kind of endeavors that we need to, um, you know, that, that, that we need to protect and it's incredibly important to protect. So, uh, but, but, but on a more, just very quickly, I mean, I think on a more kind of just personal level, it, there is, I think you would also talk about this kind of self-censorship. I mean, I think we see it news outlets, we even see it in NPR, you know, uh, a kind of self-censorship that, that sets in a sort of preemptive um, silencing to want to prove, oh, but we are so objective, when in fact it's the objectiveness that's being threatened, you know, that's being threatened in the first place. And again, I mean, this is not an analogy, but it's just you know, that it's just that as a German historian, you're always looking at how quickly things can collapse and things can go wrong. Doesn't mean that they're gonna go wrong in the same way, right? I mean, the remarkable speed with which, for example, uh, Jews were removed from the editorial boards, from the mastheads of professional journals, even before it was decreed, right? Just like, say, but we want to make sure that we can keep publishing. So it's better that, you know, you should leave and we'll stay because we're the good guys and we're gonna keep it going. And then of course, two months later, it didn't make any difference because the journal was shut down anyway, even though they had been so careful to remove <coughs> the names of the Jews, right? And so there's that, I think, you know, it, it, it's that kind of thinking about how, you know, how do we act and, and, and what are the consequences even of our sort of small actions that I worry about? Other questions? Uh, did, you, did, did, did you have a question? I'm sorry, I, mean, I shouldn't be interrupting you. <laughs> um, I was wondering about, uh, you know, people make a lot of you know, points about ideological similarities among certain segments of the right in support of Donald Trump and, of course, you know, the Nazi party. Um, do you think that there are ideological differences between other groups of his supporters? I mean, though you have on one hand the, the Nazis, though they you know, held up a lot of platforms and supported a lot of things depending on who they were trying to get votes yeah. from, uh, they have a very strong, you know, theme of control and greater security and shutting things down and making government stronger and more powerful. And I feel like if you take that, on the other hand, a lot of 
Donald Trump supporters are, you know, of the libertarian persuasion, smaller government, less government control, more leaving people alone. Do you think this is potentially a, a significant difference between the two? I think there are very significant differences. And yes, and one of them, of course, has to do with A, you know, the sort of relative, relative robustness of American institutions compared to um, this, you know, very young democracy in Germany, the fact that we're not in the middle of this total economic crisis. And yes, that there's a really different relationship to the state. I think, you know, that's, that, that is without a doubt. Um, I, I, I do think that at the point at which, it, I mean, there's some kind of strange convergence that can take place where people who are disillusioned with government and say, I don't want government controlling my life, on the other hand, can be very attracted to movements that say, this new movement that's going to take over the government will save you. Right? And so that's, I think, the point you know, to think about, that, 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 that there could be a convergence of, of that sort of libertarian, quote unquote, view with the, the big government, you know, let's have a kind of totalitarian control. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we, we're not gonna get around sort of having to say, look, you know, history can only get us so far, and I do think we heard stuff, you know, we heard such interesting material about, you know, all the ways in which the U.S. has staged this for itself. But I also think that it's very clear that some of the folks around Trump have, you know, they know this history backwards and forwards. They study, you know, they study it. And I think we have to assume that, uh, you know, they know what they're doing when they're writing some of these speeches. <coughs> Dr. Boris Marty is Distinguished Scientist and Director of CUNY's ASRC's Environmental Science Initiative, and you already told me a little bit about that. He's also co-chair of the Global Water System Project, which represents the input of several hundred international scientists under the International Council for, the, for Science's Global Environmental Change Programs. He, you know, he's, he wears many, many, many hats. He advises a variety, a variety of U.S. and international water consortia. And he's currently spearheading efforts to develop global scale indicators of water strengths <clears throat> alongside chief United Nations delegates. Thank you. Um, this uh, talk, if I can boot it up, I don't see the. Here it is. Uh, so this might be viewed as a little bit of a curveball compared to the other talks, but um, I actually like sharing the podium with, and I've done this a few times, with historians, because historians do take that very, very uh, long-term view and they try to put things into context. My job today is to try to put um, some of the important ideas coming out of the environmental research community into a broad perspective and um, in, in order to trump, to, I don't mean that to use that word lightly, the historians, I'm also going to look into the future and what patterns in the past might have set up in terms of what we're looking up to in, in the future. Uh, I put a bunch of logos, and it's probably complicated to many because these logos might not mean much to you. I put these logos on there because these are the agencies that have had faith in the research team that is upstairs on the fifth floor over our many years of doing business with uh, federal and non-federal uh, agencies. And what it is really is meant to remind you that, that this is an investment that society has already made in generating knowledge, generating truth, if you will, about the state of affairs with respect to, to the environment. And uh, it's an investment that if we're not careful, we may lose as we begin to deconstruct or as um, certain elements of uh, the government wish to um, deconstruct the research establishment. But they're literally our group and many, many, many other groups probably represent trillions of dollars of knowledge generation that is in jeopardy, okay? Um, let me put this. 
the salt the right mode here. Interesting. Okay. Um, here's some quotes. Um, I guess uh, one of the earlier speakers had, had, speaker had some quotes from some very early work on uh, nativism. Um, this is probably too detailed to go through, so you can just read it yourself. I wanted to uh, remind people that the EPA, since we're talking about environmental protection here, uh, EPA was founded in 1975 by all people, Richard Nixon. Some people say, well, he was a, he was a closet environmentalist. And others would say he was doing it for political expediency. I kind of fall on that, uh, that particular sort myself. But nonetheless, his administration started the Environmental Protection Agency. There was a great impetus in the country to do so. Uh, in the meantime, of, of course, lots and lot has happened. And if you follow what then uh, uh, candidate Trump was saying about the environment, uh, and in particular talking about the Environmental Protection Agency, it was vilified. Uh, he'd be just fine without it, for example, he mentioned. He says wind turbines, clean energy, are a scourge on, the, on communities and wildlife. They're environmental disasters. Uh, his EPA transition team head, Guy and Myron uh, Ebel, uh, is a climate denier, and he uh, also does not believe in environmental regulation because he feels that it's, quote unquote, one of the greatest threats to freedom in our modern, modern world. Enormous hyperbole having to do with environmental protection, something that was accepted by all things uh, an administration back uh, in the 19, early 1970s. Um, his uh, new chief uh, of the EPA, that is Scott Pruitt, sued the EPA 13 times Trump's uh, 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 EPA head. Uh, when he was Attorney General of, of Oklahoma, uh, he uh, says that uh, focus on climate change is going to do jobs and economic growth. We've got to roll back those regulations in a very aggressive way. And uh, the administration in general is really hell-bent on uh, trying to eliminate some of the Obama policy initiatives, uh, not just in the healthcare domain, but uh, two of his uh, capstone efforts, uh, that is Obama's capstone efforts, the Climate Action Plan and the Waters of the U.S. Uh, rule. Okay, with this as the background, and with the notion of environmental protection in the, the new realities of, of the day, uh, I'm going to let you draw your own conclusion. So, does environmental protection really hurt the economy? And I'm trying to take a really broad view. I'm trying to get out of the, the moment, the, the, the chaos of this moment. So let's take a pretty broad view. This is the long-term real growth, this is in real dollars, so, so speak of benchmark <laughs> for inflation, of US gross domestic product, one measure of success for the economy, per capita, per person wealth generation. Well, there's ups and downs, of course, but if you look at it, over a century time scale, and I uh, actually pointed out where the, e when the EPA was founded. Uh, I don't see much, uh, certainly, I don't see a causal effect between an environmental protection agency coming into play and halting the growth of the economy. It's on an inexorable rise. And in point of fact, this is one measure among many, many other measures that's indicating that humans are really beginning to, to uh, control uh, major s systems on the planet, and we're part of something called a great acceleration. The image on the left is from uh, an Economist article a few years back, and what it's trying to do is it's trying to recognize a current within the environmental sciences community to talk about something called the anthroposphere. We're in a geological epoch, I guess officially called the Holocene, but the idea is that because humans are uh, accelerating their use of resources, are embedding themselves deeply into the climate system, uh, are becoming a dominant force on planet Earth, maybe we should consider calling this geological epoch the Anthropocene. And so the economist, in its, uh, in its uh, good way, tries to pick up on, on what's happening at the state of the art in different sciences and such. It, it featured this on the cover, welcome to the Anthropocene. Well, what is the Anthropocene? It's all the stuff you see on the right. It's this great acceleration which particularly started after World War II. All of these rises in these uh, ingredients of the Anthropocene, and I'm not sure you could read it from the back, uh, and I'm not sure I have, do I have a pointer here? Yeah, I do have a pointer. 
If you look at 100, uh, sorry, 250 years of human uh, development, you can look at population, the damming of rivers, urban population, motor vehicle transport, uh, telecommunications, paper consumption, um, foreign investment, McDonald's, all this stuff is going up at a very, very rapid rate, exponentially. And that's what this great acceleration is about. And so we're mobilizing the world's resources, the world's environment, in a sense, to support our uh, well-being and our lifestyles, our pop growing population and our, and our economic uh, development. And that's really the fundamental feature about what's forcing all of this. So it should be no surprise that the economy is growing great and, and you know, gangbusters because of all this other stuff. This is backing it up. This is propelling it forward. Um, environmental scientists, global scale environmental scientists, have begun to take stock of these changes in aggregate. And uh, I don't know if any of you in the room have heard of the uh, global ecological footprint. Uh, it's an accounting scheme to try to synthesize all of the, those human activities and assess how much uh, of the Earth's environmental services are necessary to support, on a sustainable basis, human enterprise. And you can uh, they go back to 1960, the end of 2050, and this is basically this vertical axis is the number of planet Earths necessary to support humanity. And we passed the one full Earth needed to support humanity sustainably from about 1970, about the time that the Environmental Protection Agency came into being, believe it or not. And if you follow the trajectory, we're now at about 1.25 Earths. And depending on the decisions we make, or decisions forced on us by the planetary restrictions that we might be bumping into, we're either going to go down, but maybe not that far, or we're going to go way up to a point where by the year 2050, that's not too far off, folks, uh, that's going to be three Earths to support our lifestyles, our population, and our aspirations to bring wealth to all of humankind. That's just one indicator. Another indicator is this idea, and you might want to jot notes down, I can make this uh, uh, presentation available to you. But these are important ideas that have come out of the community in the last 10 to 15 years. So this, there's this idea of having planetary boundaries. And on a variety of dimensions shown uh, around the circle here, climate change, ocean acidification, stratospheric, stratospheric ozone, nitrogen pollution, uh, global land use, um, uh, biodiversity loss, species uh, losses, atmospheric aerosols, chemical pollution. Uh, anytime you see this, uh, this, this uh, broadcast of color uh, going past this outside boundary, we've exceeded the planet's capacity to absorb those changes. And the big ones are biodiversity change and actually nitrogen pollution, which is an absolute requirement for human food security because we fertilize our cropland and we create protein sources that we then that eat. Planetary boundaries, if that literature, if you're not familiar with it, you should become uh, familiar with it. Uh, another thing is something that I was involved in about 10 years ago, uh, a little bit more than 10 years ago, and it's something called the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. This was a report that was um, similar in scope, I guess, to the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, but it looked at the state of affairs with respect to ecosystems at the turn of the century. This is a report written by about 800 scientists. I was one of the 800. I led a chapter on water, of all things, my uh, area of expertise. And uh, what I want you to uh, look at here is for uh, a series of these ecosystems, about, about 10 major ecosystems on planet Earth, this is a planetary accounting. The question was, what's the state of affairs with respect to these, uh, these systems? And the colors mean how important or unimportant those ecosystems are, whether it's forests, drylands, coastal systems, mountain systems, polar systems, to uh, global biodiversity. Those are the colors, and the redder, the more important. But that's not the important thing in my view. The important thing in my view is the arrow. And the arrow is going up, show that the systems are under increasing risk. There are some flat arrows, arrows that say pretty much stable, and in only one case, is the arrow going down, it happens to be temperate forest systems. Everywhere else, everywhere where these 800 scientists looked, there was impairment of the basic ecosystems. 
So if we're expecting to have more than one planet Earth support us, we're not really doing a great job on being stewards of the single planet Earth ecosystems that we analyzed back in 2005. Uh, again, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, big, big study that was a real game changer in terms of, of looking at these development issues. This is work from my own group. This is a complicated set of maps, perhaps, but I'll, I'll step, it, step you through it quickly. There are three maps shown. The top map is that our best accounting of the provisioning services that nature gives us in terms of clean water. So nature tries to give us that quantity of water shown in the top graph. Blue water, blue waters, the darker blue meaning more people served by those water resources, okay? So you start with a nice blue planet, okay? And then you uh, basically populate the globe with, with people and their economic activities, including trying to grow crops to feed this large population, urban systems, all sorts of stuff. And you take that beautiful blue map and you turn it into a red and yellow map, where the reds and the yellows mean that there is an uh, incident threat, threat that's been imposed on this otherwise wonderful water resource. It's our impairment of those water resources. It's how we screw the system up as a byproduct of our development. And you might look at places like uh, Europe and the United States, and in the United States we have the EPA. How come the EPA didn't protect us from these red areas which are really heavily threatened? It's because we don't do a great job, despite the fact that there's an environmental protection agency. Despite that fact. And so what do we do? I mean, I go to the, the uh, kitchen here, I turn the faucet on, and the water's clean and it's always there. It's an assured source of water. So how do we get from threatened water to back to blue water? Well, what we do is we throw about half a trillion to three quarters of a trillion dollars at the problem of, of cleaning up and fixing all of these impaired waterways in the background so that when I turn the faucet on, in the, in the bathroom here, in the kitchen upstairs, it's nice and secure, it's, it's back to blue. I, I, but I do it at an enormous cost. I can do it, Europe can do it, Japan can do it. Much of the developing world is stranded because they don't have the resources to invest in that remediation. So we call it impair and repair. My friends would call it, well, why don't you just say break it and fix it? That's basically what it is. Okay, that's the way we operate for water and for a lot of other stuff. Um, in the context of all this, and getting back to the notion of environmental protection, uh, there, there's a, a fairly big literature, it's not organized in any way, but you can go out there and find all sorts of examples of how it's way better to protect these systems rather than fix the systems. And some examples are, for example, 50 to 1 payback, dollar-wise, in terms of hundred, uh, over $100 billion of U.S reduced health care costs from atmospheric pollution at only $2 billion expense to the, to the utilities. And the utilities scream and yell about the $2 billion, but these poor people who would be suffering would suffer essentially silently unless you had these laws restricting these pollutants. The toxic air standards, uh, which were challenged by uh, EPA Chief Pruitt when he was uh, Attorney General of Oklahoma, were supposedly, uh, for his state, uh, to uh, save 150 to $350 billion in health care costs. I'm sorry, nationally. Um, but uh, he uh, was, was arguing against the EPA rules as state attorney general. Six to one payback for uh, protecting watersheds that feed our own water supply. Uh, and if you used floodplains, natural ecosystems, to control floods instead of uh, 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 allowing floods to occur, you have 100, uh, 100 to 1 payback on investing in these natural ecosystems. If you used dams and reservoirs, it's still a good deal, 6 to 1 payback, but it's nothing like the 100 to 1. So there's great value in, in my view, of re re uh, making sure you protect and when necessary revitalize these ecosystems that have very important social dimensions, but also an economic value. It's not that hard to actually argue this, okay? 
Now, uh, cranking back a little bit. Uh, year is uh, 1972. There's something called the limits to growth. Again, for those of you who don't know about this stuff, you should know about this stuff. And I've been looking back at some of this work uh, earlier from the 70s because it's now coming to a head with the challenges that we see emerging in the 21st century now. And uh, this is a book that was published by the Club of Rome. One of the uh, main um, uh, proponents was a guy named Dennis Meadows, who ended his career at my old university, the University uh, of New Hampshire. Uh, and uh, I'm going to do probably the bravest thing you've seen any speaker do uh, the whole, the whole uh, three hours here. Uh, I'm going to show you what things looked like and what my limits to growth were back in 1972. <laughs> I couldn't grow a beard back then. Now there's no limit to that growth. Um, and you can imagine this kid kind of just coming out of high school. I came out of high school, graduated in 72. Uh, looking at this stuff, and th these were the spaghetti bowl diagrams that came out of this analysis. And uh, it's hard to read, but this was the state-of-the-art computing systems back in the early 1970s. And you had these big pages that were produced, and it took a long time to print them. And this is what you would get. And just to clarify this a little bit, back in 1972, when I was reading this stuff, these guys were forecasting the future. Okay, they were looking out to the year 2100. All future stuff, right? Um, I got older, time has passed, and back up in the early 2000s, they started a series of studies to check these results. Because we had 30 to 40 years of real data to compare to. So it wasn't a formula. You could actually look backwards and say, how well did they do? And in many of the dimensions that they looked at, per capita wealth, birth rates, death rates, food supply, population, industrial uh, uh, output, and pollution, the systems were dead on in terms of what they predicted early on and what the real data showed. That's a, the good news for the modelers. The, the terrible news is if you were to follow this, I know it's a spaghetti bowl, but all these inflection points, all these things coming down, is an indication that the system is collapsing. That there are going to be severe limits to what a planet that inherently has limits can produce. Technology can help us some, but there's this basic intrinsic idea that there are limits to what the system can hold. You can argue, we can argue to the cows come home about what parameters were used, and we could fiddle around with it. But when they reanalyze this, there's a statement here that you probably cannot read. You say, by and large, there are some very unique conditions that have to come together where you can get some sustainability. But if you don't have all of those things coming together, which is going to require everyone coming together and figuring out what to do in a sensible way, uh, collapse is a potentially inevitable, inevitable, or a hot of high likelihood. I don't want to scare anybody, but this is what the, the other researchers are talking about. One of the striking things about the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment is that when they looked into the future, they had these different scenarios, and they were an ecosystem assessment. So they were trying to look at proactive environmental um, thinking and, and management versus reactive. So they were looking at global industrialization, the global economy. They were looking at uh, something called techno garden, where you would look at global environmental patterns you try to minimize the stress on the system. Or looking more regionally, it's global and regional, looking regionally, it's kind of the, the garden effect. Could we actually uh, use green infrastructure to uh, sustain the planet? Okay. But the one on the top right really, it always struck me because the cartoon was a really weird one when I saw it 10 years ago. This is way before the current administration, way before any of the stuff we're talking about here. There is a wall uh, that is separating the rich countries, literally a wall, between the rich countries and the poor countries. And it's something called order from strength, where there's a re regional retrenchment. And the, um, the different regions begin to foster their own self-sufficiency. But of course, they can't be self-sufficient because <coughs> modern industrial societies have evolved over the last many decades to rely on global trade. So what happens is they begin to degrade their systems. You can look at some of the 
economic aspects of this. The order from strength scenario doesn't do well on several, several measures. It's the worst on several measures. And this is called improvement in ecosystem services, improvements or degradation for global orchestration. That was at the uh, top left. This is the top right. <coughs> there are no bars that are showing improvements to ecosystems because by drawing a wall around yourself, you've got to rely on your local resources and you cannot do it without overstretching the bounds. Okay? There's also, since we're toying with this idea, uh, there's this idea of collapse. Okay? There's another book you all should be reading. It's a book called Collapses by Jared Diamond. It was maybe about 10 years ago that he published this. Uh, he talks a lot about island states in particular. And he uses island states as kind of a metaphor for what might be happening globally. And the island states are really interesting because he looks over long history, like archaeological uh, records dating back hundreds and thousands of years. Uh, a lot of his work cites uh, one of our faculty members from Brooklyn College, Sophia Perdicaris, who's an archaeologist and anthropologist. And she and her colleagues and and Jared Diamond uh, looked at many, many examples of how humans outstrip the carrying capacity of their environments on islands. This is before any fossil fuels or, or, or any you know, industrialized society. Uh, but what it does is it makes some really, really interesting points about how through, through human hubris, arrogance, uh, warfare, uh, just crazy thinking, they outstrip the capacity of those island states to support the population. And time and time and time again, you see these collapses. To, to the point where it's almost a bad habit that we have as a species. And one of the points made in the book is, well, it's maybe not so far of a jump to get to the global scale, given the fact that now we have all sorts of uh, telecommunications, fossil fuels, our capacity to move beyond the bounds of any small island. And maybe there's some lessons to be learned here. Um, we didn't talk too much about climate change. Uh, for those of you who don't know about this, there's plenty of writing on this. Um, I've sort of taken a back seat in terms of doing my own research on this. It's a pretty crowded field. There are people working on that. Um, this is a, a nearly million year uh, record of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Okay. If you notice, there are ups and downs associated with Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, generally warmer climates, and these declines, cool, cooler climates, lots of glaciation, etc. We came out of the last glaciation about 20,000 years ago, and we came into the Industrial Revolution. And guess what we started doing? We started pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and we're here at the time this was published, I guess this is three or four years ago, we're just under 400. We're now above 400 parts per million, way above way above what we had for nearly a million years prior. And uh, it's probably no accident. You could debate it. I don't debate it. It's based on basically high school, high school chemistry, the work of Lavoisier and Arrhenius. You have a greenhouse gas, you're pumping it into the atmosphere, something has to happen to the atmosphere. Uh, it should be no surprise that since 1880, uh, we're recording record temperatures globally. And uh, the last, uh, 10 warmest years have, uh, since 1880 have occurred in the last 17 years. And I think 2016 might have, might have been the warmest arc. I'm not quite sure, but it was certainly close to the record. OK, why is this important? Why is this important? All this stuff might be of academic value, but we are living in a, uh, an integrated, interconnected world. And there's this other big notion that you should be familiar with called tipping points. Okay. And using the climate change as an example, you pump enough carbon dioxide and trap enough of the solar energy coming into the planet, don't reach back into space. All sorts of mischief rains. You could begin to melt the Greenland or the Antarctic and ice sheets, uh, which would have all of these ripple effects through the system, through the oceans, through the atmosphere. Too many to, to enumerate right now, and I'm getting the, the, the cutoff time here. Let me just say that these are nonlinear impacts. We are barely able to understand all their dimensions. We recognize they're there, but we don't have a perfect knowledge about what the hell happens 
if we double the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? We don't know. And therefore, we need more research. So at precisely the moment that we need the most research, thank God we have an administration that's putting lots of money into this research, and this kid can sleep at night. We're studying the tipping points, folks. That's sarcastic. No laughter. No. <laughs> like, was that such a dark? Was that such a dark <laughs> talk? It was such, I'm trying to just scope it out, and you can make your own own judgments. Final point. I'd love to show this uh, uh, Salstein uh, cover of, of the New Yorker. Uh, New York has been deemed one of the energy efficient cities. Okay, and. You know, we walk a lot, we take a lot of public transportation, we're packed into small apartments, and that's, that's more efficient. But New York City would not survive without the very interconnected birth system that I'm talking about. Uh, just try to grow enough food for New York City, see how long that would last. Do it on a rooftop garden, see how long you can survive. We'd be at each other's throats fighting for food. You can't survive unless you look beyond the Hudson, okay? And this is that really classic classic uh, notion of a New Yorker's view of the world. And again, I'm just going to draw the conclusion. I'm trying not to be an advocate. I'm just trying to lay out the logic. At precisely the moment, we know the system's interconnected. At precisely the moment, we continue uh, our population growing and aspirations for everyone to not be poor. Something might give. And at precisely the moment, we don't know what exactly will give is when we're really going to have to be struggling to argue for basic research, which to my mind plays into Jared Diamond's notion that people make mistakes over and over and over again, but they know better. And so with that very negative last picture, I end. Uh, there's a lot of material that you can find on the website if you wish to, uh, wish to take a look. And anyone who wants a tour of the facility, just uh, come see me later. We'll try to of psychoanalysis from a feminist perspective. More recently, in the last decade, she has spent time working on a project for acknowledgement in the Middle East between Israeli and Palestinian mental health and workers and community organizers. Dr. Benjamin's most recent book, Beyond Doer and Done Do, Recognition Theory, Intersubjectivity, and the Third, will be out in about eight weeks for Rutledge Press. Oh, gee. Um, I think, you know, we should just all start to drink. <laughs> but, uh, you know, obviously our species needs a good therapist. And I'm not uh, saying that would be me, but uh, I will say that, you know, clearly there's a lot of insanity behind all of this. So I see myself as justified in speaking, even after this extremely clear scientific presentation of our dilemma, because now I want to talk about the irrational reasons uh, that we are where we are, which is uh, being unable to deal with it as well as we'd like. Um, I did come from a slightly different angle, though, um, namely the angle that I was hoping that some of you who are here are going to devote yourselves to actively resisting uh, the current assault on our democracy, our planet, our lives, and so uh, it's written from that point of view. Um, let's start with the idea that our country is now divided and polarized, and from our side's point of view, we are virtually at war. The Civil War, the struggle over abolition of slavery, maybe the last time America was so ridden, though the struggle culminating in the New Deal was fierce. Uh, it was not a loss of faith in government exactly like Atina describes, but a fight over who will own the government, which we are now seeing once again. In the words of Lincoln, the struggle that was joined between those who viewed liberty as the right to dispose over the bodies and labor of others, and those who believe in the liberty of all to dispose over their own bodies and labor. Uh, we might also add the planet to the bodies. Viewed in this way, 
the struggle against slavery and the struggle against the oppression and exploitation of all labor, as well as the right to control our own bodies, could be seen as part of one struggle. Those of us who have been on and off fighting these battles for most of our lives may be surprised to find that while our side nominally lost the election, uh, technically, it has never been so unified, so determined, and persistently active. Trump has brought this about, it seems, by flagrantly uncovering the hidden violence, greed, grabbiness, rapaciousness of the unholy alliance between capitalist oligarchy and xenophobia, racism, and sexism. His more openly lawless behavior finally moves some of our liberal democratic establishment out of denial to face the truth that the South has been winning the Civil War for nearly the last 50 years. But now that we are facing it, we might need to think about the psychological consequences of engaging in a pitch battle of us versus them. My psychoanalytic take on this involves extrapolating from the opposition between self and other that occurs between individuals, moving into thinking about the oppositions that manifest socially as us versus them or the other. Such self-other oppositions take the form of doer and done to, by which I mean oppositions like perpetrator and victim or power struggles in personal life that might be familiar to you. The main lesson we've learned from individual power struggles is that this relationship is reversible. In do or don't do relationships, both sides may come to resemble each other. Our struggles can too easily be shaped defensively by those who attack or accuse us so that we get into a ping pong match, a back and forth of blame, and find ourselves asserting that there really is a right way and a wrong way. What we need to retrieve to step out of do or don't do relations is the position that I think of as the basic lawful third in which we recognize not only wrongdoing, but the suffering that it causes. Denial of wrongdoing is the central point of my talk. Um, in that way, I think we could extend it to what is being done to the planet right now, but I have to admit that what I had primarily in my mind as a paradigm uh, was uh, race and class, just because uh, the pronounced way that it's playing out right at this moment. The first problem is how to get beyond, I shouldn't say that because really tomorrow is International Women's Day and you know I salute everyone here uh, in the name of all women everywhere um, but I admit that um, I'm extrapolating from what I see as the basic uh, basic figure of male-female domination to thinking about the specifics of the economic oligarchy because of the very things that Charles was just talking about. The fatal way in which the seizure of power has affected us. Um, anyway, the point that I would stress is that when you are in a do or don't do complementarity, you don't simply want to reverse it. And uh, even though we might simply we want perhaps at times to grind the other into the dust, um, this is not really what our political strategy can be. The Trump gang and the Republicans who are nervously enjoying the power he is giving them, like little kids in a candy shop, actually believe that winning is everything and must be achieved at all costs, and that the harm they inflict by winning can forever be denied and covered over. They think the issue for us is likewise winning and that our side lost, thus defining us in their terms. We think in very different terms, I believe. We think in terms of protecting the people, the democracy, the planet. We do not believe that the only world is one of doer and done to, winners and losers, which justifies doing anything to win. But psychologically, we must admit that the belief underlying their position is one that is held by some people all of the time and most people some of the time. It is the political imaginary, the fantasy of only one or only some or only one side can live that underlies the fear and shame currently driving some very hateful behavior as well as many people's acquiescence and submission to that behavior. 
The way I see it, the core fantasy, only one can live, operates in projecting vulnerability based on fear of annihilation. And the belief that we are living in a kill or be killed world. For some human beings, a Trump or a Bannon, this fantasy is the whole of reality. There is no other world. For other people, this is a feeling state that is activated only in moments of threat and fear of annihilation, rather than accepted as an obvious truth. Now, in a world where only some, or one, can live, the fundamental division is not only between those who have power and those who are helpless, the dominators and the dominated, but also those whose suffering is recognized and those whose suffering is not. I refer to this as the dignified and the discarded. As a psychoanalyst, I try to understand this process of normalizing a kill or be killed world in which some are dignified and others discarded. Why does that work for some people? My roots are in the neo-Marxist critical theory tradition of the Frankfurt School, which integrated the critique of capitalism with psychoanalysis. So uh, the psychological issue that I consider is how domination and exploitation are mystified and normalized. And in that sense, the question of what we do now here in the university or in the broader sphere of those who resist or those who think about it has to do with how we confront that mystification and the way we think about that in terms of the history of our country, which as we know was built on harming, on genocide, on slavery, uh, although not only on harming, which is something we have to try to bear in mind. The belief that only some can live is also embedded in the material present in the economic system and the idea of the nation. For many people who would reject such behavior in personal relations, this fantasy is projected onto the social realm. For instance, they see the nation as threatened by the outside world. They may not treat all individuals they meet as threatening. But economically, the idea that some will live well and others barely survive is justified as the only possible social organization, even though it involves the exploitation and theft of other people's labor. In the narratives of power that are expressed everywhere in popular culture, many of the popular TV shows right now, like billionaires, those who are ruthless and strong enough to exploit others will live, or they will live more and better. And they will control women, who originally were the primary weak ones deserving of control by the strong. Trump embodies this fantasy in its purest form and has exposed its ugliest underside. But we need to recognize that he's not its only representative, that this psychology of only some will live has a strong religious underpinning in Calvinism and Puritan fundamentalism, which originally united two contradictory ideas. On the one hand, all humans have a sinful, greedy nature that must be checked and disciplined. But on the other hand, this religion gives permission for ruthlessness, for grabbing power in the name of self-preservation, because the successful are seen as the ones who are not parasites and the ones who deserve to be saved. Others will be discarded. Of course, this happens when there are too many workers and capital has no use for them. Now, the problem is, that that whole worldview contradicts our democratic ideology, which, at least in theory, should see all members as part of a collectivity that, in which all deserve to live. And that democratic idea contradicts this fundamentalist idea that authority is good that those in power are good, and that to impugn the goodness of those in power, even if they've achieved their power by harming, is bad. Now, this whole good-bad thing is very complicated, and I really uh, 
can get lost in it, I have to admit. Shame enters into the picture here. The fear of being among the socially discarded instead of the deserving, those who are left to perish and visibly diminished, obviously leads people to feel anger and helplessness. This has been talked about nonstop since the election. However, what we know is that people accept a large amount of blame for their own helplessness. They think that they have been discarded because, in fact, they did something wrong or didn't do enough. And in order to both exploit that fear and reassure them, the Republicans have successfully developed the strategy of saying that they, the forgotten men, are not shameful and weak because that shameful weakness actually belongs to the other who cheats and takes from them, blacks, immigrants, women, the liberal elite who supposedly champion all those weaker groups. Now Trump added some vital new ingredients and took this idea of the war between us and them to a whole new level by removing the shame from a perverse form of winning that crushes losers. And in this way, reassuring the men and sometimes the women who identify with him that they are not the discarded other, not the losers. By flouting law, rules, convention that the enemy elite embraces, he perversely modeled the enjoyment, the pleasure of breaking the law. Now, of course, I actually think that despite the many differences, it's the psychology of this that is most similar to National Socialism. The um, idealization of the leader who is able to transgress, that kind of thing. Um, and that's part of why everybody's talking about it, not because there are exact historical resemblances, I think, but because there are very close psychological resemblances. Um, so, even though to some of us it is obvious that the hatred of women's bodies that Trump expressed is based in feelings of weakness and helplessness, and the disgust and depreciation of others whom he calls weak is based on his own hatred of himself. That is apparently not evident to everyone. And we who see in his expression of this kind of hatred an impulsive lack of control, and in fact an expression of helplessness, are only on one side of this story. And on the other side of the story are people who actually have grown up believing that this is how people in power express their strength by showing that power and showing that only they can live. How are we going to deal with this profound, not just political, but psychological divide and the way that it then makes people take a stance toward harming others? Um, to me, this is a really difficult political question. Uh, I'll just go on with a few more ideas I have about that. Um, the ordinary people, men and women, who identify with Trump's violations and consciously believe he's flouting the elite, not pillaging the people, at the same time unconsciously identify with his grabbing and winning and defying the law as only a rich person, a privileged person, indeed a king, can do. And this makes him their hero. The ability to appeal to this contradiction, which I do think is typical of fascism, is his secret. This solution to the contradiction of people feeling or being the underdog and yet identifying with the top dog includes making people feel that they are deserving victims. In other words, that they are being victimized by the elite who try to shame them, while at the same time they are allowed to see themselves as deserving rather than shameful because they are like the top dog who is now going to redeem them and trash the elite. In addition, all those elements of being discarded are going to be put into the other, the excluded, the one who is now being walled or out or banned. 
I guess when I was thinking about it, I tried to imagine what is a good way politically to approach this story. And I think of it in terms of harming and the way in which harming is accepted and is the way of showing power in our society. Again, it's not the only way. We just had a president who showed dignity and power by the opposite in many ways, but it's a very strong current. Associating manliness with aggressive power, associating white purity with subjugating people of color. Now, all this harming, I believe, has been covered over by the ideology of American goodness. And in a sense, the very fact of our democracy has been used as a way to deny this other side, the dark side of America. This is really our sort of Jekyll and Hyde country. Um, how do we confront that history? What do we do about that history? One of the things I'd like to see us not do, and learn from the past of political movements, is to be divided. And to have those who are oppressed be divided rather than united. This usually happens when people struggle over the moral capital of suffering. That is, when victims feel that they have to be recognized at the expense of some other victim being recognized, which again brings us back to this problem of only one can live. Whenever you're in this oppositional polarity, you can start to suspect that this fantasy is at work and that this is what needs to be deconstructed. We need to get off that seesaw, because even though, of course, there are scarce resources, and we've now seen that the planet's going to run out, there isn't necessarily a scarce resource when it comes to recognition. We don't actually have a limited amount of compassion and recognition. What we have is the belief that only some can have compassion and recognition. There's not actually a limited amount. For people who feel ashamed of their needs and at fault for failing, of course, it's especially hard to admit that others have been victimized through their actions and through their fault, because if they were at fault, then they would be bad. If they had allowed others to be harmed, they would deserve punishment. And now they would deserve to be on the bottom. And now they would deserve this reversal. And now it actually would be true that the others who are victimized should get the better of them. So they're kind of in a bind, which we have to help them out of. Um, not that I'm sure we can do that. Um, my experience clinically is, you know, mixed, so-so. You know, sometimes you get, get people out of that, sometimes they fall back in. But, the point is, I see it in this way, that we need to deactivate this fantasy, even as someone like Trump is activating it and stimulating the fears around this fantasy that only some can have. We need to keep emphasizing the fact that, in many ways, there is enough for everyone. There is enough respect for everyone's suffering to go around. There is enough dignity for everyone. What stands in the way of that? It is a really perverse ideology that we've seen, for instance, in the uh, response to Black Lives Matter, where um, a kind of competition is, uh, a twisted competition is developed. And it appears as if the, uh, those who want their rights are trying to turn the tables, and blacks will live at ex the expense of whites. Turning resistance to oppression and harming into political correctness has been one of the most powerful strategies of the right. Um, I believe that this reversal of doer and done to, which is a very powerful psychological structure, can be to some degree overcome. That we can counter the fear that only those who win the victim's sweepstakes get helped and that others are discarded. Uh, one way that won't happen is if we assign all goodness to ourselves and all badness to the bad people. Um, so basically, I think I'll just sum this up by saying that 
I see one of the main obstacles to dealing with this problem as having been solved by the terrible crisis we have gone through. And that is that the issue of harming is no longer covered over and the liberal ideology that America is basically good, we don't have to face up to this, uh, I think has been, in a sense, exploded. Um, we can now have a very different idea of where goodness lies. Goodness is not, in the view of the resistance, located in the strength and power to control others, but rather in the voicing of demands for respect and for mutual understanding and support by people of very different backgrounds who share a recognition of vulnerability. And the recognition of vulnerability, which dignifies all kinds of suffering that we've had, that recognition of vulnerability, along with the need that we have to make certain kinds of economic demands on behalf of the large numbers of people, is different than these constant pronouncements that America is good. In fact, it's the opposite in my view. I think we have to understand that it is possible, even in America, to talk about something that has occurred in the last decades in particular, and that is that we have a whole party devoted maliciously to supporting oligarchy and suppressing democracy. Again, it's a very different situation, but think about the analogies with what Bettina said, in the sense that conservative center people were willing to go along with a great deal as long as they could protect themselves. Now, I want to find a way to think about it, at least, how we can take advantage of this moment where it has become obvious to many people in the liberal establishment that this is not working and this has not worked for them. And that the oligarchic party is not going to be defeated by them talking about how good we are. We are going to have to be nasty women. We are going to have to talk about the harm that economic exploitation does. Um, it's striking to me that the liberal elite and media, as I see it, and the people in the Democratic Party, tried to shame Bernie. Um, that is to say, to put him in a position of weakness, and that he, and so this is like, regardless of what you think about all his political proposals, right, he refused to be shamed. He actually said, no, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you that I believe we could do all this for everyone, and it's not shameful, and it's not stupid. And so, he changed the idea of what it meant to be strong in a very powerful way for a large number of people. Being strong no longer meant expressing yourself in a way that you protect yourself from being ridiculed by a large portion of the media. Now, of course, it helped that Trump didn't mind being ridiculed either, but I don't think that's primarily what Bernie did it. Um, so I think that what Bernie represented was a statement that really everyone can live. Really, there is enough. As my last point, I want to say that in order to protest against the unchecked harming of the wealthy class that is trying to consolidate more and more power in this historical moment. I think it's absolutely necessary to consider the way in which harming has been accepted in our society, has been socially, psychologically accepted, and that's why in particular I'm emphasizing the history of racism and slavery because I think it's an critical moment for us to talk about what hasn't happened in our country, and that is there hasn't been 
an end to the Civil War that involved national reconciliation and a truthful confrontation with what happened here. And by contrast with Germany, there's been less national discussion of how, as a nation, as a country, we really are obligated still to repair that wrong, that it's still being carried from generation to generation. I see this as a moment when a form of acknowledgement and a form of unifying ourselves to make repair on our side could be a model for those people who are so frightened by the way they have been implicated in racism that they cannot, in my sense of it, they cannot actually unite to oppose their own class oppression because they have been so complicit in racial hatred, xenophobia, and so forth. So I actually think helping people to become extricated from this history of harming is a kind of liberation that could have a certain positive effect in terms of people also being able to fight for economic democracy. And I think that understanding the way in which um, most people, as I said, not all people, most people really want to get out of this killer we killed world. Most people would like to feel that they could repair in some way what has gone wrong so that they don't have to live with this level of shame and guilt, or many people feel that way. And I see this as a national opportunity uh, to bring that into our political discussion in a real and vital way. So that's kind of my message for uh, what uh, I as a psychoanalyst see about the current moment. I'd be happy to talk with anybody about it. Well, I'm less able to talk about her winning and losing, but I, I, had, I had a whole section, but I was really trying not to take up too much time here. So, um, I think that Hillary Clinton was caught in a really interesting bind. On the one hand, she absolutely believes that America is good, and she saw herself as part of the good people and also part of the good, powerful people who were entitled to rule, who were entitled to have this power, which she thought she would use for the good. And I'm not against that, because I think almost anybody that does anything useful is going to have some of that belief. But on the other hand, she really sacrificed her own awareness of the way in which uh, the attacks on her that started already in the 1990s signaled a much more irrational force that was at work, this irrational, hateful force that she really didn't know how to speak to and address. And um, which the liberal establishment, in a sense, doesn't know how to speak to and address. Right when people know how to mobilize hate, liberal people don't know how to talk about hate. And that's our dilemma, and that's, I guess, the simplest way to say what my message is right now. So I think her not being able to address that hate um, head on, you know, and having to like bury herself in all the details of how many emails she had instead of really talking about what it meant that she was being attacked in this way. Uh, it's a very interesting thing because oddly we have this crazy person who's now, you know, rampaging in the White House who would have found a way to talk about people doing that to him that would have been much more emotionally direct. I mean, it would have been paranoid, but it would have been direct. So uh, that's, I think, part of our dilemma is dealing with hate. But hate as, a, as it is associated with actually harming people. Everybody feels hatred, that's not really the point. It has to do with harming people, taking the hate you know, out of yourself and putting it out there in a way that's destructive.
political correctness or um, certain way in which we, we ask people to know, not, speak, not speak in different ways and, mm -hmm. and backfire, right? Um, so the question is really how, how would we go about that in a more productive way? Even, even in the classrooms, even in the university. Well, part of what I was trying to get at very briefly was that I think that as long as there's competition over whose victimhood is going to be recognized, it's very hard to extricate yourself from uh, a position in which what you say will appear to be defending or championing one group over another group. It seems to me that especially a politics of nonviolence has to be really very clear that all suffering matters and that all harming matters. And so when people who have been harmed by the economic system then turn around and are hateful and harm others, you, you can't be saying the harm that was done to them doesn't matter because now they, they're harming themselves. No, you have to be aware of those contradictions. And I think that um, there are many other psychological aspects to uh, the way in which people find it difficult to recognize the um, sort of psychological meaning of pumping badness into your image of the other uh, and inflating their badness in order to create your goodness. That is not the same as a politics of recognition where you really respect everyone's suffering. I, so, Getting that down is something that some people just do intuitively, I mean, and just do really well. Uh, but it's something that, in, especially on campuses, needs to be very self-consciously reflected on, I think. And that is, how can you recognize and respect harm, people who have been victimized or traumatized or harmed without turning that into a kind of moral capital of suffering, which gives them a right to, in certain ways, condemn other people. Yeah. Um, thanks. I really enjoyed both of these. I have about five questions. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, there's a, a really clear opposition in your talks, right? Between, on the one hand, uh, Charles is saying that there's not enough for everyone to be well. Um, and then you're saying that, on the contrary, at least in psychological terms, there, there's enough to go around. Everybody, there's enough recognition, or there's enough uh, positive. And maybe enough to go around so that we could think together about what to do about the problem that Charles is bringing up, because we keep making especially bad decisions based on the fact that we don't think together. So if we don't create more forms of sort of socially cohesive, positive, uh, supportive thinking together experiences, we will not deal with these things even remotely wisely. Uh, what people, people who know very well that the environment is a problem don't let themselves think about it or they vote against their environmental interests because they are feeling personally beleaguered in certain ways and uh, their self-esteem is under attack and when their self-esteem is under attack and when they don't have any vision of uniting with other people to fix this. And those two things are very importantly sort of on one or the other end of the seesaw, right? You attack people's self-esteem or you can give them uh, communal organizations that empower them. I mean, so th these are the, so I think there actually are ways that you can lend these two perspectives together, which doesn't mean that in the end we're going to save everyone from death, but it does mean that we're going to take responsibility for doing our best. It's very different. <laughs> Sorry. Um, which is great. Um, can I ask another one? Um, yeah. Well, I'm going to come back to it because that's a little bit yeah. I mean, My question was uh, along the same lines as uh, Professor Deckel's, which is, you know, I, I think there's a large portion of, they're not entirely white, mostly young white men who've been radicalized into this kind of, you know, alt-right line of thinking. Can they even still receive those messages? Or can they be reintegrated back into polite society? I mean, I, I, I don't know if that's even an answerable question to me. 
Well, I think that what our, our goal politically when, when for organizing resistance is not to immediately go for the most hardcore opponents and try to win them over. I think what we are trying to do in some way is to distinguish ourselves from them in a way that allows many people who are confused to feel that our side is the more hopeful, uh, the more embracing side in which their own identity can still be preserved. So that would be my first thought. And, and then I think that what happens to that smaller group of people when our majority is really well integrated is less dire for us. I also think, though, that uh, if we're thinking about the next generation of you know, college freshmen who are coming in, young men, I do think that an interesting question was raised by a psychologist in uh, New Mexico for me recently related to this, which is what happens to young men when they feel as though they're being told that they can only have a perpetrator identity? Like, it's very important to offer people something besides a perpetrator identity and not have them feel that innately men have to have a perpetrator identity. I'm sorry, what's that? What's a perpetrator identity? Oh, you know, that all men are uh, sexual predators and aggressors, and yet oh. they're being seen in that way. Like, oh, yeah. In other words, it, it's, it's like if you go to like these, these uh, you know, group college meetings where the kids ask questions about uh, the, what college they should go to, in their senior year in high school, and like repeatedly, the question just keeps coming up. Well, is this campus safe? You know, is this campus sexually safe? How does that feel to a young man who thinks that he might be going to college to have fun? It means that he's being told already that his desires are probably going to hurt somebody else. So we we have too much language of harming in certain areas, and not enough realization that people are more complex than that. Yeah. Do you believe that the psychoanalyst's job in our current globalized, um, you know, economy is really to demystify the concept of nationalism? Because for one to feel the predication of victimhood versus victimized in a global sense, right? We are now dealing with more macro concepts. Would it not have to be within relations to nations? As your book about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is just one example of. Um, for it is the reason that, as you said, is this fictitious concept, this illusionary um, concealment of real larger issues, which do not say that, you know, for the psychoanalyst, the job is to demystify nationalism so that all components of victimhood and victimized essentially collapse within themselves. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, although I'm not sure nationalism is the, um the term nationalism has so many different meanings. I'm particularly concerned with the idea that you have to see all good as being on your own side and uh, project badness into the other. And there are many other ways in which, you know, our nation versus them gets calibrated. I can't, um, I can't go into all of that right now, but I, I mean, that's, it's a good start. The thing is that I wasn't actually speaking from the point of view of nations that much right at this moment. I was thinking more in terms of our nationalism and the anti-globalism as being more of a mythic and fantastical construction in many ways because, not to say that globalism hasn't had an economic effect, but that this sort of mythology of these other countries who are taking away our jobs and, and these immigrants who are coming in and taking away our jobs, all of these are, you know, acquiring a mythic status. And so the myth of the nation as being some us, whoever that us is, and the them as being the invaders and the destroyers, seems to me to be um, something that is uh, working for people to manifest some other kind of fear. Because as we know, the immigrants aren't even in the places where people are most afraid of them. So I mean, what is that fear? We need to understand that fear, I, I think, is coming much more from the punitive authoritarian structures that people are raised in that are constantly shaming them on the one side, and the real lack of economic opportunity for them to overcome that, uh, that sense of worthlessness on the other. Yeah, I think other people want to have a chance to redeem the work. Okay. Uh, I was I, I've noticed that your talk and the professor whose last name 
I could take an hour Charlie trying to Charlie uh, pronounce correctly. His talk is based on statistics, yeah. but his statistics are a reflection of what you are saying in California. Uh, he's talking about a zero-sum game, and so are you. It, yeah, but not in, he's, he's not just talking about a zero-sum game, because if I understand it correctly, this is, a, this is something we cannot solve in a zero-sum way. We're no, gonna, no, I'm not suggesting that. Yeah, I, I'm, oh. I'm suggesting only that, oh. that there are ways around the zero-sum game. Oh, okay. But it is a very difficult obstacle, and especially it just keeps getting worse because you said the Civil War is winning, the South is winning the Civil War, and I very much agree with that. I believe that the stain of slavery has never been confronted in this country. That that would be the biggest first step that we could make in terms of recognition. Because America is recognized for better or for worse as a global leader. And yet, despite the statistics that indicate we should join together and enlarge the pie, and despite you know the, the, the side from which you approach it, uh, it seems almost it seems a very daunting task. And I don't know how better to talk about it. Uh, if, if, I I, don't. if I might just, just say, the, the, some of the curves that I was showing, everything shooting up and overriding the capacity of the planet to, uh, to sustain uh, the, these trends. Uh, some of the proponents of those very pieces of science recognize this is not going to be about more resource use and uh, increasing uh, the caloric content of diets and more meat. That's not the issue. The issue is one of governance. And so we actually are joined at the hip. We didn't really, really recognize it. But without that basic mentality change, right. the curves will continue to go up. And that was the whole point of, of, of this book by Jared Diamond about class. It was human behavior that destroyed the system uh, and, and the humans do better. But despite that knowledge, they overran the systems. Okay, and so what I'm also trying to add to that is the override takes place because there seems to be almost innately in us a, a part of uh, ourselves that really believes that we can only live at the expense of others. And people who are especially wedded to that proposition run multinational corporations, run economic institutions that make these kinds of decisions. In other words, they tend to be more thinking about how they can survive, not how all can survive. And they don't have the mentality of how can we all live. And that mentality, I mean, that's not true for all of them, right? But for many, many of them. And so, and because partly because this is how you rise in the capitalist world, and this is how the capitalist world was organized, by exploiting others' labor. So this is the mentality you get. So changing that mentality really has to come, I think, from a mass movement of people outside those board groups. And I really believe that we could create that mentality. And, I mean, there, I don't have a recipe for that. I was just saying that, like, in terms of my own experience, one way to do that is for us to be clearer about the fact that we can face harm and we don't have to just, you know, crumble up in shame and die because we know we've been part of the harming and we've been complicit, and that then weakens us unbelievably. We need to have the strength to face it so that then we can actually get together and do something about all the problems. That's sort of the, you know, simple version of that.